Thank you. I want to acknowledge that our Sergeant at Arms, Mr. Boyd McKenzie, got married last uh, weekend. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, congratulations, Boyd. I understand that the union is going strong even still, so uh, thank you. Uh, let's all uh, let take a moment of reflection to uh, think about our own uh, relationships and uh, the upcoming debate today. Thank you. Thank you, Boyd. Colleagues, I'll begin uh, by acknowledging that we're in Mi'kma'ki, which is the traditional, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And here in HRM uh, and across Nova Scotia and other parts of Mi'kma'ki, we are all treaty people. Community announcements and acknowledgements. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to acknowledge a couple of things. Um, remind folks that tomorrow evening in Dartmouth South at Woodlawn Library at six, seven o'clock, I'll be hosting a town hall meeting. Um, the district boundary review activity, uh, opportunity for public engagement at Harbor East Community Council will be next week. Thursday, October 24th. And I want to put a shout out for the Turtle Patrol today. Yeah, got, a, got a great message last night around some endangered turtles that we happen to have the pleasure of housing um, around Russell Lake Trail. And working with staff today, we were able to connect all of the appropriate players, including the Department of Natural Resources, the construction managers, etc. So we have successfully, or at least they're in the process right now of mitigating any impact on those turtles. So thank you for them for, uh, you know, raising the alert. Well, thank you, Sam, for referring that to me. Uh, thank you. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. No, I just want to send a shout out today to uh, the uh, folks at St. John the Evangelist Church in uh, Middle Sackville. They uh, hosted the uh, first ever uh, Sackville Community Fair on the weekend, and it was uh, it was kind of cool. It was nonprofits and community service providers coming together, almost like a, a science fair type presentation, and it was uh, an opportunity for uh, groups to find out what others are doing and for the public to come on in and see what services are available in the Lower Sackville upper and middle Sackville area. So thank you to those fine folks for uh, hosting uh, the community this past weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. And one of the folks that was at the, or one of the groups that was at the community fair was the Sackville Area Warming Centre. Uh, this is an organization that has been in existence for a while and they are now operating out of the St. Elizabeth Seton. Um, it used to be a church. It has been uh, uh, deconsecrated. Um, and that's on Metropolitan Ave on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evening from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. Uh, and it is entirely run, um, it is entirely staffed by volunteers. Uh, so if you need a place to go in the evening to, to get warm through the winter, uh, they are now open again, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday evening, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And if you are so inclined, please consider uh, helping out uh, and going to the, uh, uh, the warming center and, and seeing what you can do to, to volunteer. I would also like to uh, congratulate uh, four individuals in Lower Sackville. We have a, a Sackville Sport Heritage Hall of Fame uh, hosted at the Sackville Sports Stadium. And uh, over the past uh, week or two, um, there was uh, an induction ceremony where Derek Brooks, who is a coach with volleyball, 
uh, Derek Dempster, who is a coach and an athlete with track and field, uh, Hannah Hubley, who is an athlete with wrestling, and Leslie Ann Young, uh, who is an athlete with uh, canoe and kayak, were inducted into the uh, Sackville Sport Heritage Hall of Fame. And finally, I'd like to congratulate the 305 uh, Royal Canadian uh, Sea Cadet Corps of Sackville for their change of command ceremony, moving from uh, Lieutenant Commander Pickram as the CO to Lieutenant Pickram as the CO. Um, it was a great ceremony, uh, and uh, just congratulations. The Corps is doing amazing things with our youth. And um, so thank you. Thank you for that, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am very pleased to acknowledge Giant Steps Children's Center for 20 years of service to families in the Upper Tantalan community. Uh, Lisa Rondo and Donna Buckland held an incredible event on Sunday. Uh, the, the, the just It was packed with people. Everything was there. We had so much fun and the cake was amazing. Uh, just, you know, I think providing childcare services to such a growing community is very important. I just want to thank Lisa and, and Donna for all their work over the last 20 years. I also want to invite folks uh, to come and meet with me on Sunday, October the 23rd third at the Estabrooks Hall in Hubley at two o'clock. We're going to have a town hall and chat about all things that are important to residents and businesses in District 13. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to, <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge that um, for Mi'kmaq History Month, I had the pleasure of joining Halifax District RCMP, uh, as well as victim services and staff from the Department of Justice uh, to experience a blanket exercise led by our uh, elder uh, Debbie Eisen. It was a phenomenal experience and an incredible uh, learning experience uh, to understand uh, the history of Indigenous people here in, uh, in Mi'kma'ki and uh, hope that our school system will include that very important history. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to start off by acknowledging that October 18th is Persons Day in Canada. It marks the day in 1929 when the historic decision to include women in the legal definition of persons was handed down by Canada's highest court of appeal. This gave some women the right to be appointed to the Senate of Canada and paved the way for women's increased participation in public and political life. Through this decision, though this decision did not include all women, such as Indigenous women and women of Asian heritage and descent, it did mark critical progress in the advancement of gender equality in Canada. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the women who have advocated and continue to do so for the rights of women around the world. I would also like to mention that um, tomorrow evening in Spryfield, there is the District Boundary Review uh, Public Engagement Session that's being held from 6 till 8 p.m. And on Thursday, there is an online town hall that I'm hosting with our West Division Commander to talk about community safety in the Spryfield and Sambro Loop area. So um, I encourage anybody who has anything they want to discuss to join us online. And um, you know, it's a great opportunity just to, to talk about some issues and, and some solutions. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two quick announcements. Tomorrow, uh, October 19th, we are happy to celebrate the opening of the Jumpstart Playground in the George Dixon Field. That will be happening tomorrow at 10 a.m. from 12, so please, anyone who is interested is welcome and uh, welcome to see this exciting playground that will be opening in the Dixon Field. And also, uh, happening Friday, October 21st from 12 to 4, uh, celebrating Mi'kmaq Heritage Month at the uh, Everyone Every Day uh, shop on 2169 Godison Street. There's a, a day full of events from the first being a smudging ceremony all the way to um, beaded keychains. So take a look at their website, uh, Everyone Every Day, and uh, enjoy some of the programs happening during Mi'kmaq Heritage Month. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, on Wednesday, tomorrow night, October the 19th, uh, 6.30, 
in Dartmouth North, there's our annual walk against violence. It's unfortunate we still have to do this walk, but the community comes out. Uh, it's a good turnout. Uh, we encourage everyone to show up uh, uh, to speak out against violence, and that's going to be at 60 Farrell Street, uh, starting at the Boys and Girls Club, 630. On Saturday, uh, Saturday Councillor Austin and I are going to be hanging out at the uh, Aldery Landing Market. Uh, we're not selling our wares, uh, but we're going to be there for the seems to be a common theme to discuss the uh, district boundary review. So we're going to be there uh, with information, encourage everybody to complete the survey, and then uh, come out uh, to our Harbour East Marine Drive that Councillor Kent alluded to, which is on Monday night, 6.30 uh, in Aldery across, from, across the hall from the library. There's going to be a presentation from the committee that's working on the uh, district boundary review, an opportunity for residents to come out and give their opinion. And I encourage everybody to come up. There's significant impact, in my opinion, negative impact to Dartmouth. So we need everybody to come out to, uh, to talk about the district boundary review. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I also just wanted to follow on Tony's uh, heels there. He uh, mentioned our um, community council meeting for public engagement for the district boundary review. So this has big, big changes uh, for District 4. There will be no longer a District 4. So for folks in Coal Harbor, Westfall, Lake Loon, Cherry Brook uh, to come on out and make sure you uh, have your voice heard. And also having our first District 4 Town Hall meeting next week on Thursday, uh, 6 to 8 at Coal Harbor Place. So if this affects you in the District 4 area, come on out and share your thoughts, suggestions, and concerns. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I've been on the phone a lot today. <laughs> Thank you, uh, sure Councillor. You're welcome to stay. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chair. Um, last night at the Northwest Community Council, we had the district boundary review and uh, an amazing, beautiful turnout from uh, Lakeview, Fall River, Wellington, Grand Lake. Um, it was just amazing, and I think we've convinced a lot of people that they should live in Lakeview. Uh, a few people have decided maybe they might look for uh, some homes there because it's such a beautiful community and needs to stay in the community of families of um, Lakeview, Windsor Junction, Fall River, LWF. Um, there's another meeting on district boundary um, in Middle Muscadabit at the Bicentennial Theatre on Thursday evening, so we're hoping that that area uh, will, will be able to, to come out for 7 o'clock. Um, tomorrow evening at Golf's Fire Station, we're having a councillors' meeting with guests the MLA. Uh, Larry Harrison is going to join us, the RCMP, members of the Department of Transportation to talk about community issues in and around that area of our community. So that's 7 to 8.30. Um, and then Friday night, there's a ham dinner in Myers Grant, so we'll take a drive down. Colors are really nice. It's a good little drive down to the Muscadabit or to uh, Myers Grant, um, and it's in support of families, help, helping hands, families supporting families, um, and that fundraiser addresses food security in Muscadabit Valley. So, if you don't want to cook Friday night, come on out to Myers Grant. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Well, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, coming up this week on Saturday is the Great Potato Layoff and Pie Auction at the Seaforth Hall. This is a great fundraiser for the Community Hall Society there. And you'll see some imaginative uh, potatoes as well as some very expensive pies that get auctioned off. Also this week in October 22nd, 23rd, uh, at the Kinney Place, the old Nova Scotia Home for Color Children, they we're looking at the uh, black market uh, on, on Saturday from uh, 10 to two at the Ball Center, but on Sunday at two o'clock in the afternoon is the grand reopening of the old home now to be known as Kinney Place at the two o'clock and the general public are welcome to attend. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. My apologies. Uh, Councillor Cuddle, when uh, you mentioned uh, the women are persons, I just wanted to take a brief moment to do a, a humble brag because uh, tomorrow I am uh, leaving for Ottawa to uh, attend the Order of Canada ceremony, where my mother-in-law, Barbara Patterson, will be receiving the Order of Canada. She is a sculptor behind the famous Five statue that rests on Parliament Hill and in uh, Calgary. And of course, the famous Five and women are persons are very intertwined, so uh, I just wanted to take that, uh, that moment to uh, congratulate uh, my mother-in-law, Barbara Patterson, on receiving the Order of Canada on Thursday. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, we can't wait. <laughs> That's so awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, Colleagues, I want to just acknowledge the uh, people who organized the uh, 40th annual uh, Nova Scotia Fallen Peace Officers Memorial on Sunday and recognize the name that was added this year, um, which everybody will recognize as Constable uh, Heidi Stevenson. And uh, it's a very touching <coughs> event for uh, her, her f husband Dean, family were there. So it was a, it, it's a sad thing to add a name, but it's an appropriate thing to do. and especially in light of uh, two police officers being killed in uh, Innisfil, Ontario last week, reminds us of the work that our police officers and first responders do. Okay, I'm gonna ask the Deputy Mayor if she'll read the proclamation for Kootenai. I'd be honored, Mr. Mayor, thank you. This is for the HMCS Kootenai Day, October 23rd, 2022. Whereas the HMCS Kootenai, a destroyer escort, experienced the worst peacetime accident in the history of the Royal Canadian Navy. On the 23rd of October 1969, an explosion ripped through the engine starboard gearbox when Kootenai was approximately 200 miles off the southeast coast of England. As a result of the fire and deadly toxic smoke created by the explosion, nine crewmen died and 53 were seriously injured. Years later, the disaster remains deeply imprinted in the memories of the survivors. In fact, most survivors have been diagnosed with PTSD, for which they are receiving professional counselling. As a result of the lessons learned from the Kootenai crisis, the RCN, as well as other navies throughout the world, made significant changes to ensure much higher safety standards, which render naval ships much safer for today's sailors. Although all 240 crew members lived in the Halifax area in 1969, there are still several survivors of the tragedy and their family members residing in HRM today. Therefore, be it resolved that I, as Deputy Mayor Pam Lovelace, on behalf of Mayor Mike Savage and Regional Council, do hereby proclaim October 23, 2022 as Kootenai Day in an effort to raise awareness of this RCN tragedy of 53 years ago, so it will always be remembered and commemorated by the residents of HRM. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor, and uh, let people know that on the 23rd, which is this Sunday, there will be a, a commemoration. Um, for the Kootenai family, um, and that will take place at uh, a number of places, but for us most notably in Point Pleasant Park. Thank you very much. Does somebody want to consider the approval of the minutes of September 29th? Moved by Councillor Hensley, seconded by Councillor Stoddard. All in favour? Opposed? Done. Order of business, Mr. Clerk. There are no additions from this meeting from the clerk's office today. Anybody else? Does somebody want to consider moving the order of business as circulated? Councillor Cleary, seconded by Deputy Mayor. All those in favour? Opposed? That is carried. Consent agenda, colleagues? Does somebody want to move that if there's no changes to it? Moved by the deputy, seconded by Councillor Blackburn. We're going to vote on the machines for the consent. So that carries. We've, by consent, we've then moved 1511, which is an award for managed print services. We have approved 1521, which comes out of audit and uh, finance, which is a park development budget increase. That is approved. And item 15.4.1, which is Heritage Advisory Committee. These are financial incentives for Schmidtville and the Old South Suburb Heritage Conservation Districts. Those are moved on consent. Business arising. Declarations of conflict of interest. Motions of reconsideration, there are none. Rescission, there are none. We do have some deferred business. Item 10.1 is a proposed administrative order. This is from August 23rd and September 29th, respecting the African Descent Advisory Committee and proposed 
amendments. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move the motion that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to... Sorry, Sorry uh, Councillor Smith, I apologize. Um, we have a heritage hearing which uh, should come right after we go through these uh, motions. So we're going to do the heritage hearing and then I'll come back um, to that. Correct? Because uh, it's as close to one o'clock as we can get. Sorry, Councillor Smith, my fault. Okay, we're going to move to the heritage uh, hearing. First one is 12.1, request to include 1245 Edward Street, Halifax in the Registry of Heritage Property for the Halifax Regional Municipality. We'll ask staff, so the process here is we'll ask staff for presentation, we'll have questions of clarification, we'll open the heritage hearing. The property owner will have 10 minutes. Uh, if there's any questions of clarification, that will follow. Uh, and then we will move uh, to, uh, to debate on that. So we begin with the staff presentation, sir, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council. My name is Seamus McGrail. I'm a senior heritage planner with the Heritage Property Program, Planning and Development. This is case H00539. I request to include uh, the property located at 1245 Edward Street in the Registry of Heritage Property for the Halifax Regional Municipality. So Peggy and Sh Shyman Walt, on behalf of a group of local residents, have applied to include the property located at 1245 Edward Street, Halifax, in the Registry of Heritage Property for the Halifax Regional Municipality. The subject property is located on the east side of Edward Street, in the middle of the block between University Avenue and South Street, shown here on the map. It's near the southern limit of Edward Street. The property contains a two and a half story dwelling, which was constructed in 1897. The property is surrounded by other residential properties and large institutional uses, including Dalhousie University and the IWK Health Center. Mrs. Susan Sapp lived in this building for more than 50 years, up to the age of 95. She raised children, ran a daycare, housed university students, and recently replaced the roof on this building. In 2021, her home was sold to Dalhousie University, who owned the Glengarry Apartments next door. HRM staff have notified the property owner, Dalhousie University, of this third-party heritage registration application. Dalhousie has applied for a demolition permit for the building, but has not yet been granted approval for the, for the demolition. This, this application is being considered under the Heritage Property Act and HRM bylaw H200 and its uh, scoring criteria. There's a number of uh, scoring criteria, six in total and I will go through a, a description of each of these um, themes uh, now. In terms of the age of the building, the building at 1245 Edward Street was built in 1897 and directories show that the first, uh, that the first occupier of the home was William McCullough Boak in 1898. The, the building has historical associations with prominent Halifax families of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, namely the Boke family and the Hobrecker family. William Boke was one of numerous merchants in the prominent Boke family of Halifax. Boke ran a commission merchants and wholesale grocery out of a building on the western side of Lower Water Street. He purchased lots from the Edward Shields subdivision in 1897 and commissioned the construction of this house on the subject property that same year. Rudolf Holbrecher purchased the building in 1912. Rudolf was the oldest son of a prominent and wealthy German immigrant family, um, Alexander Holbrecher and his wife, Charlotte, uh, pictured here on the right. The, the elder Holbrecher owned and operated a Holbrecher wholesale tobacconist out of the Prince of Wales building, which still stands today in Granville Mall. Rudolf Holbrecher worked for his father at the Granville Street tobacconist shop and would later strike out on his own working as a commission merchant and eventually managing Kelly's Limited, a leather goods company. Rudolf and his wife Elizabeth, or Bessie as she was known, raised two boys and two girls at this house and eventually sold the property in 1957, having lived there for 45 years in total. 
In terms of the architectural merit and the, the construction of the building, the dwelling is a two and a half story building built of light frame balloon construction with a roughly rectangular plan. It is built atop a masonry foundation of coarse rubble and stretcher bond brick. The brick portions of the foundation are primarily surrounding the basement windows. The outside walls are clad in a combination of wooden shingles and uh, wooden clapboard. In terms of the architectural style of the building, the residential building exhibits a mix of styles consisting of a, of a transition between the, the Second Empire and Queen Anne Revival. So shown here, um, on the right, on the top right is an example of a uh, Second Empire style building on, on Queen Street. And you can see the style exhibited in the subject building through the mansard roof and the um, brackets under the eaves. So the, the, the Second Empire style is also exhibited in the rounded headed windows on the front and sides of the building. It also includes a mix of a Queen Anne style, and there's an example of a Queen Anne style also in Schmidtville from South Park Street on the bottom right on the, of the screen. And this, this style is exhibited through the tower formed by the double bay window, windows on the front of the building and the tower portion of the roof with the sm small dormers as well. So this style is uh, known generally as Victorian eclectic. It's, uh, it's a, a, a common style in North America, less common in the United Kingdom. But the, Vic the Victorian eclectic style was popular during the late 19th century when uh, builders would mix styles together. Uh, a good example of a Victorian e eclectic building one is the one you're sitting in right now. Uh, Halifax City Hall is a Victorian eclectic building um, incorporating six different architectural styles. So the, Victoria, the Victorian eclectic style is very much part of our, uh, of our Canadian heritage. Twelve forty five Edward Street exhibits a high level of architectural integrity with respect to layout and additions. The house retains its modified rectangular plan with minimal changes. It, exhibit, it exhibits a moderately high level of architectural integrity with respect to condition. The roof was replaced about five years ago, as mentioned. The architectural integrity under this category is, is, applies to the exterior, not to the interior of the building, as the Heritage Property Act does not, uh, does not apply to the interior of uh, private uh, properties. The Canadian National Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, known as ECOMOS Canada, produced its own international charter in Appleton, Ontario in 1994. The, Appet the Appleton Charter is, is one of the source documents informing the national conservation standards that HRM has adopted. Both the Appleton Charter and these conservation standards make a clear distinction between integrity and condition, as do the HRM Heritage Building Evaluation Criteria. So the integrity of a building is the degree of change based on substantial alterations to the exterior. It also looks at things like uh, reversibility, if, if changes have occurred to the exterior of a building, are they reversible or not? If they're not reversible, then that, that impacts the, the um, integrity of a building more than, uh, than reversible changes. The condition of a building can always be improved through investments in the building. HRM includes one of the most uh, resourced grant programs in, in terms of municipalities across Canada. Uh, um, allowing for uh, grants of $30,000 over a four-year period for prop re private properties in residential use and grants of over 50000 to private properties in commercial use. In terms of its relationship to surrounding area, it's one of the oldest, older buildings on the street. 1245 Edward Street is considerably grander in style than the 16 other 19th century, early 20th century buildings surrounding the property and, and, visu and within visual range of the building. It's primarily Queen Anne revival style stands out among the 16 Victorian plain style houses with their mostly flat roofs and two story bay windows. It is the most architecturally interesting building on the block located in the center of the block contributing greatly to the neighborhood character and supporting the residential streetscape. 
It is within, the property is located within the established residential designation and the ER2 zone. This, uh, this established residential use and designation extends from the property along Roby Street to the railway cut and north to Coburg Road and Spring Garden Road. It continues north to, to um, North Street as well uh, in behind the, the, uh, the higher order or the corridor designation. Twelve forty five Edward Street bears a strong relationship to the surrounding neighborhood through the neighborhood's very consistent two to three story scale and primarily residential typology. And up on the screen is the criteria and the and the scoring that the Heritage Advisory Commi Committee arrived at. Um, points for age, historical importance. Um, architectural merit and style and integrity uh, for a total of 64 out of 100 award uh, of a, out of 100 points in total and a positive recommendation before regional council today thank you very much thank you very much Is there any questions or clarification from council um, If not, then I will open the heritage hearing and I will invite the property owner to address uh, council. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you for uh, being here. Um, you have up till 10 minutes. Uh, the clerk will be the uh, timekeeper. Appreciate you uh, joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to Okay, sorry. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to address council. I'm Gita Kolzicki, Vice President Finance and Administration at Dalhousie University. I'm here today with Peter Rogers, a partner with McGinnis Cooper who is representing Dalhousie as external counsel, and my colleague, Laura Hines Jenkins, uh, Dalhousie's Director of Government Relations. We have also submitted correspondence, which I believe each of you should have. I'll hand the floor over to Peter and then to Laura. Peter. If you press the button, it should, uh, there you go. There we go. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Gita, and thank you for the technical assistance from Council. Uh, Your Worship and Councillors, I plan to speak for about six of our ten uh, allotted minutes. In the PowerPoint uh, as I speak, and I won't be referring to the slides individually, but in the PowerPoint as I speak, you'll see some slides showing photographs of 1245 Edward Street um, during my talk. Um, and while, uh, while looking at those, please don't just look at the poor state of the building, but also look for the inconsistent interventions carried out upon the original structure, the major build over of the original steeply pitched roof, converting an attic and roof area into four substandard rooms and putting a leaking uh, flatter roof overhead, the random application of clapboard over wood shingles on some of the walls, the aluminum storm windows hiding the deteriorating window conditions beneath, and the insertion of orange uh, spray foam into gaps in the foundation walls, as well as the haphazard brick and concrete block inserts into the foundation wall itself. In contrast, uh, Dalhousie's real historic buildings, some of which will be shown uh, during Laura's presentation, have been preserved with great commitment and pride at Dal's own expense with no heritage registration or subsidy. They help create the warm and scholarly atmosphere of Dalhousie's Halifax campuses. Dal's campus in Halifax is something both the university and the city can and should be proud of. 
Dal has prepared written submissions which have been pre-circulated to you and I hope you've all had the opportunity to read them. Uh, these include a statement of Dalhousie's own position on Dalhousie letterhead and uh, they also include a heritage evaluation report by Terry White of Plus VG Architects. He is a professional heritage architect and his CV is attached to his report at the end uh, showing his credentials. He strongly disagrees with the scoring assigned by your advisory committee. His is the only professional architect's report before you and it has scored this building at 32 out of 100, half the score asserted by your Heritage Advisory Committee and insufficient by a wide margin to meet HRM's threshold for heritage status. I will come back to one important point in Mr. White's report later as that's all I have time for unless you ask questions afterwards, which I hope you do. Uh, first, I want to speak on some process and big picture issues though. Registering a property as a municipal heritage property can be done, we know that, without the owner's consent. But just because it can be, doesn't mean it should be. It doesn't mean it's wise to do it. You have the right to make a wise decision. In this case, as you did two years ago, when you had a, an application before you, relating to some 17 Spring Garden Road properties whose registration was opposed by many owners. Council should be especially wary of allowing third party applications as that can provide simply another forum for neighbors to oppose densification that is already a major problem uh, of, of uh, housing in Metro and furthermore, the support or lack of support of an owner for registration should be a major, major factor since it greatly affects the likelihood that heritage will actually be conserved, that something will be accomplished by registering it. For an owner whose perfectly lawful plan from the moment of acquiring the property was to demolish this failed structure as it's described by the engineer, professional engineering firm and the architect firm, and imposing heritage status on it, it's an extreme interference uh, with the owner's property rights, which should attract a high level of due process. In this case, though, Dalhousie University strongly feels it has been given inadequate process rights on the fate of its own real property. And I don't have time to talk about that, which is one of the problems, but I urge you to ask me questions about uh, our concerns of the process. Contrary to what has been implied in some circles, there was nothing sneaky or wrongful about Dal's demolition uh, permit application or about what Dalhousie was doing on site. It was openly removing moldy and asbestos contaminated building materials from inside the building while awaiting issuance of a demolition permit, which it intended to apply for from the very moment it bought the property, this uninhabitable former rooming house. Two so-called notices of violation were issued against Dal by staff in the midst of a social media frenzy, but they have no merit. Dalhousie will contest and in my opinion win handily any attempt to prosecute it in respect of them. Dalhousie's sense of unfairness about the process of being magnified by what seemed like an effort on the part of staff and committee members to fall over themselves to award spurious unwarranted heritage points. Please ask me about that and I'll give you a small but extremely telling example amongst other things. And bad process often leads to bad results and that's our view of what happened at Heritage Advisory. Finally, I want to come back to that one notable thing about Dalhousie's historic, its real historic uh, buildings. And this relates to the important consideration recognized in the world of heritage conservation and protection and that's in the concluding pages of Mr. White's report. These older Dalhousie buildings, these real heritage ones, they have vitality, they're in full use. People are experiencing the heritage and history around them in a dynamic, natural, and genuine way. They show heritage in action, not lip service to heritage, which is the most you can do if you uh, register this property. There is not a viable use for this structure unless you consider vacancy for three or more years to be a continued use. Please think about what will actually be achieved or not achieved if you vote to register it and ask yourself if you really would be advancing the public good.
Dalhousie does not have a magic wand to defy economic laws of property management. And neither, I suggest, does council. I thank you for hearing me out and pass the torch on to my colleague, Laura Hines Jenkins. Thank you, Peter. My colleague has outlined Dalhousie's reasoning in opposing registration of 1245 Edward Street. What I want to emphasize is Dalhousie's deep and enduring commitment to preserving collectively understood historic assets. Every day when I and almost 30,000 other Dalhousie students, staff and faculty log into my email and files, I do so against a backdrop of one of our most iconic historic buildings. Every year when Dal recruiters visit high schools and university fairs across Canada and around the world, they do so with view books in hand that give priority of place to Dalhousie's space, to the campus buildings, quads, and environment that prospective students could call home. As a 200-year-old institution, we understand the significance of space. We know that when someone says Dalhousie, it evokes an image of the iconic Hicks clock tower. We value the fact that the majesty of the forest building inspired Lucy Maud Montgomery's Redmond College. Preserving and maintaining these and other significant historic assets has been and continues to be a Dalhousie priority. Since 2006, Dalhousie has invested over 25 million on exterior building envelopes, preserving historic elements even when doing so was more costly. We plan to invest a further 26 million over the next 10 years. Dalhousie's planning towards 2030 accessibility requirements and net zero targets includes work to upgrade and update our inventory of historic buildings with preservation of historic features in mind. 30 seconds remaining. As an institution that is predominantly funded by student tuition and taxpayer dollars, we balance our commitments to historic buildings with our obligation to provide students, researchers and staff with accessible, functional spaces to live, work, learn and play. In order to preserve and maintain the forest and the hicks and others, while also absorbing recent enrollment growth and planning for future growth, we look for strategic opportunities to densify. For example, we made the decision in 2010 to replace these houses that accommodated a small number of offices with our new student residence, Le Merchant Place, which is now home to 326 students, as well as dedicated health and medical resources and services for international students. Both Halifax and Dalhousie have seen notable growth over the last several years and anticipate more going forward. We know that Nova Scotia and Halifax's growth is inextricably tied to Dalhousie's and those across the post-secondary sector. Registration of low density, inaccessible buildings, absent consideration of the impact on other strategic priorities will significantly hamper Dalhousie and Halifax's ability to meet growth targets. As we chart a path forward with an eye towards preserving aspects of our city that embody historic Halifax, we need to be prudent, preserving exemplary examples of Halifax's heritage while leaving room for growth where existing buildings are in poor condition, aren't fit for purpose, and provide little scope for densifying and creating accessible, inclusive spaces. I have to ask you to wrap up, please. Sure. We are committed to continuing conversations that prioritize preservation, but also acknowledge that preservation is not always practical or in the best interests of the university and city. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to uh, all three of you for your uh, presentation. I'll see if there's any questions of clarification. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Thank you. Um, uh, to, to the speaker there, um, you asked about, uh, you, you said something about your concerns um, regarding the due process of this. I was wondering if you could just kind of elaborate on what, what you meant by that. And also, what are the intentions if this doesn't um, go through today uh, to become a heritage proper, property? What are the intentions of this property after demolition? Thank you. I'll leave the second part of that question, if I may, to my colleague, uh, 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 Vice President uh, Kulczewski. Um, in, in terms of the process, uh, Waiting until a property is on the brink of uh, facing the wrecking ball is not the right way to go about heritage registration. And what it produces is this scurrying around 
uh, of activity, in this case brought about by a third party application, but encouraged and abetted to some degree by staff and the committee. Uh, the first thing that happened after, uh, um, after that was that the Heritage Advisory Committee accelerated its hearing date in order to make ineffective a demolition permit application that was already underway perfectly lawfully. And the result was that that hearing got, you know, jammed up. Uh, we had no time to prepare um, a written submission. And indeed, uh, uh, not only was the hearing date moved up by the uh, Heritage Advisory Committee, we only learned uh, 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 four days before the hearing that that's when it was going to take place. I call it a hearing. It's not a true hearing. It's a, it's a process of the committee. But they are deciding substantive issues, not just advisory. They're not just making a recommendation. It's the last opportunity to engage the heritage uh, uh, people who are, uh, you know, with the staff. And uh, it has a substantive outcome in the sense that it bars demolition of the, of the structure. So it's not just an advisory committee. It makes a substantive decision. So that was accelerated, and Dalhousie learned of the accelerated date only by accident because it actually had somebody on the Heritage Advisory Committee. And they learned of that hearing, and they asked uh, four days, I think, before that date, they asked for whether they could attend and make a presentation such as we're doing today, and they were told one day before the hearing that they couldn't, but that they could make a written submission. Well, we cobbled something together and got it in, but it wasn't put before Heritage Advisory until uh, uh, I think an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half before the committee met, probably most of them were on their way to the meeting, and you know, it just wasn't an effective way to be heard. So it, it wasn't a fair process, and of course, we don't really think 10 minutes is a, is a very good amount of time mm -hmm. to really delve into the issues, the failures of this building, the physical problems with the building and with attempting to restore it, and um, the mongrelization, I'll try to use that word, mongrelization of the structure when they uh, built, we don't know when, but it was, this place was a rooming house, and these four rooms that you have on the top story and a half, they were put in. Uh, they were put in in place of the, the, the peaked roof there, uh, underneath this cobbled together, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know the right word for it, but the flatter roof that's over the top, which as it turns out, was leaking like a sieve. So uh, those four rooms, they're uninhabitable. They wouldn't meet modern standards of egress as noted in the architect's report. So, uh, you know, it's just not enough time and it's too big an issue. It's just not right to register things unless you're going to accomplish something useful. Uh, so I, I think that's all I should say on that. I've spoken enough and perhaps I can turn it over to uh, my colleague here. Thank you. We have no immediate lot plans for the property. Um, you know, Dalhousie's been around for 200 years and we are continuing to grow. We have grown together with the city and with the province. We plan to continue to grow. So it's really done with a very long-term horizon in mind. Um, so we have no immediate plans for the use of that property. Thank you. On questions of clarification, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just have two questions. Um, in the presentation, uh, you referenced um, that the property would be vacant for three or more years. So are you saying that Dal's intent then, if this were registered, would be to, wait, would be to submit the demolition permit and then proceed to demolish anyway, even if it's registered? Because that three years is what the Heritage Property Act says. Um, what we will do is uh, once we hear Regional Council's decision, we will undertake what, to consider what our options are, Councillor. Okay, so that three years is reference to that? We will consider all of our options that we have available to us once we hear Council's decision. Okay. Um, so I think we already talked about the, uh, the zoning of the property and the growth of the university. Um, th as far as I can tell, I mean, this property is, it's an ER established residential zone. Um, so if, uh, I'm wondering what was the impetus for the university to buy the, pr the property in the first place? 
where it's, I mean, basically the highest and best use on the property in the current zoning is what's there. Um, we will look long term um, at properties that are at land that could be of value to the university. We were obviously attracted because we own the property right beside it. And so we just thought it was an ideal opportunity to acquire a piece of property that in the long term interest of the university could be very valuable. But there's no, there's no current plans then? As I said earlier, there are no plans at this time relative to that property. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, just a couple of points of clarification there. Uh, so uh, what was the date that you purchased property approximately? How long have you owned it? In 2021, I'd have to look back at what That's the fine. Um, so uh, you had said you had no immediate plans. There were uh, many rumors in the community which were expressed to us via various forms of communication, email in particular, uh, indicating that you were intending to use as a parking lot. Is there any truth to that? The only uh, discussion that came up relative to parking was what we might do, be able to do with it temporarily, and it was just an informal discussion. You know, d could it serve any any purpose to that? Obviously, being mindful of and guided by whatever the bylaws say. So there was no firm plan. It's not the reason for which we bought the property, as I said earlier. Um, and you said you have no immediate plans. Do you have kind of tentative plans in the next two, three, four, five years? And the reason I asked before you answer is we, we literally just brought in a new bylaw, a land use bylaw uh, in the regional center. And typically, uh, you know, unless there's extraordinary reasons to do so, we don't rezone land after we've just literally rezoned it. So we finished center plan. The first package was uh, 2019. The second package was last year, so approximately just before you bought it. So the land would have been just rezoned and then your plan then would be, because you're talking about denser, par possibly parking, other things, which would all require rezoning. Uh, so your plan would be to ask us to rezone the property to do something that we just said you could do this with it. We have no plans at this time to ask to rezone the property. We have no plans for the property. I'm just thinking as, you know, as taxpayers, about half of Dalhousie's money comes from taxes. Uh, is that a wise thing to do with taxpayers' money, is just to buy property and sit on it? That's clarification. I'm just asking, so they have no intentions. I'm just trying to understand why they bought the property and why they're here asking us to do something with the property or not with the property when they don't seem to care what happens to the property. Um, I think I'll try to answer the question in that. We have no immediate uh, plans for the property. However, Dalhousie having been here for 200 years and hopefully being here for another 200 years um, will of course require uh, additional lands over time as we continue to develop along with the city, along with the province. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. The staff gave a, designate, uh, a rating of 64 out of 100, and the uh, Dal's um, consultant gave, what was it, 32 or 34 out of 64? I'm just wondering, I think it was 32 you said. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on the areas that there is a significant difference between the heritage recommendation um, and Dal's, please. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, let me just start with one that's very small but very telling, uh, and that's a score assigned by Heritage Advisory uh, on the recommendation of staff, I believe, uh, uh, scored at one for uh, the um, uh, historical significance of the architect or builder. The architect or builder is unknown, so our uh, heritage architect scored at zero, and I do note that uh, uh, the uh, Heritage Advisory Committee also scored zero on a recent application, more recent than this one, uh, in connection with uh, a Br Brunswick Street property that was coming forward on a heritage, uh, um, uh, a heritage application by the actual owner. So we actually got a score of one for having an unknown builder. 
on Brunswick Street, they got a score of zero for having an unknown builder. That's a very small example, but the bigger examples relate to the integrity of the building. I'm not sure whether your staff person was able to go inside the building and see uh, the photograph which is in the package uh, from, from the Heritage Architect uh, that shows, uh, for example, figure 13, uh, figure 12, that shows where the old roof was and how much that's changed. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether he was in there or not, but that's a major reason why uh, the high scores awarded for architectural integrity, for example, um, uh, by your staff person were not accepted by the heritage architect. And uh, so he scored that significantly lower. I think I actually wrote down a comparison here. So you can find the scoring, uh, the actual heritage advisory scoring is on page 13, which is a very small faded out number in this report of the, uh, of Mr. White's report from VG plus, or plus VG, and his own uh, score is shown on page 14. And so you'll see some major differences uh, for example, in the areas of uh, architectural merit, construction type, there was nothing significant as far as our uh, architect, architectural consultant uh, was concerned on that one. And he scored that a zero, whereas your committee scored it a five. Uh, your committee scored almost perfect uh, marks on the next three categories, architectural merit, style, architectural integrity, and relationship to surrounding area. All of those ones were scored only one point less than the maximum possible score awardable for those items, whereas Mr. White scored them significantly lower, and he explained all the reasons for his disagreements in his report. And uh, again, to some extent, he had a greater advantage because we know he was inside the building and he could see some of those, uh, you know, mongrelized changes that had occurred to this structure. And uh, he could also see a little bit better the deteriorated condition, um, which uh, is very apparent uh, when you're inside and you see these uh, orange foam uh, in, in the rubble wall presumably to keep vermin and water from, you know, uh, coming into the, the building um, and uh, that sort of thing. And you see all these bulges in the foundation. Anyway, uh, that, those are the main areas, architectural merit, style, architectural uh, integrity, and relationship to surrounding area. I mean, the next door property is a three-story apartment building. I don't know whether it's from the 50s or 60s, but it's not, um, it's not of the same type, and nor are the surrounding properties, which I think are described as uh, Halifax flat roof uh, structures. Uh, they're not of the same type. These are quite, this is quite a different structure. Uh, and, uh, you know, from the point of view of an architect, he views eclecticism not as a plus, an architectural plus, it's considered a negative. This is just considered a mongrel structure. It's not considered a, 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 an exemplary structure of an architectural form. So those are the main differences. So the reference to a mongrel structure is what comes from your, what was in that report, more so. It's my characterization yes. of his words. Okay, I, thank you. He's probably not as aggressive as I would be. I, I agree, thanks. <laughs> thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I thank you uh, for being here today. Uh, I wouldn't use the term mongrel, but I would certainly uh, suggest that it's more of a red-green duct tape kind of approach <laughs> to keeping things together. Uh, having purchased a house that was built in 1867, and uh, over the years there were certainly bits and pieces of uh, leakages and so on and trying to keep that foundation uh, uh, safe. Um, and so my question to you is around the... Um, sort of the discrepancy similar to where Councillor Daigle, Daigle Gammon was going with this and in that when we think about integrity of a building uh, and bringing that building back to service and repairing it to the point where we, where we could actually make it a viable, have it a viable use as to what it was before, um, as Councillor Austin had pointed out, we're talking about a residential building, right, with for housing. 
but I'm, I'm not seeing um, the uh, relationship between the process for heritage advisory and the actual brass tacks of today. Is there actually gonna be anybody living in this building? Uh, is this building going to have any use in the near future? And I'm getting the sense that it won't. So then I question, what are we doing here, <laughs> right? And so I, I just think that there's a failure of process. And uh, Peter, I'm just wondering if you could speak to that piece around viability um, from, a, from a, not only a fiscal responsibility perspective, but also a safety issue. Uh, at what point could this building actually be safe to house people? Thank you. Yes, well, I'm not an expert in that, but I do think, I mean, we've had, uh, the Heritage Advisory Committee did get a copy of the engineering study by, I think it's called Construction Management Engineering Limited, and their report was also reviewed by the architect. So you got two layers of professionals, and both of them agree that this is a failed structure. So, uh, I mean, Dalhousie probably isn't a, a party that would I even investigate whether you could, uh, you, you know, have tenants in, in these buildings. It's certainly not in the slum landlord business. If, you know, it's in more the accessible residence business than that kind of a business. So it could never do that. And I don't even think anybody else could lawfully do it. I mean, I understand this elderly woman, it sounds like, I hadn't heard this story before today about about Mrs. Sapp, but it sounds like she was living there, you know, many, many years into her mid-90s, and, uh, you know, people can, can live in these structures for a long time in a state that you wouldn't dare to rent them out to a, a member of the public. And I, I, I kind of think that's what we have here. We have, we have a, just a person who stayed in, like older people often do. They don't make many changes, and they put up with whatever's going on around them, but the, the new person who acquires it can't do that. Mm. It's not viable. Right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. No other questions? Then we will thank uh, the folks for joining us today, and I will look for a motion to close the Heritage hearing. Moved by Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor Kent. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you very much, Councillor Mason. And uh, if staff wish to uh, uh, answer any questions, they, they, uh, they can. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council approve the request to include 1245 Edward Street, Halifax, in the Registry of Heritage Properties for Halifax Regional Municipality as shown on Map 1 of Staff Report dated June 24, 2022, as Municipal Heritage Property under the Heritage Property Act. Second, Councillor Cleary. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cleary. Whew, what a day. What a great start to a meeting. So, um, uh, you know, I didn't expect to have to say something like this, but I think to contextualize, with all due respect to Dahazi's presentation, that staff and the committee were scurrying around, I found offensive. Uh, because this is allowed by the property, the Heritage Property Act, and this is allowed by our policy. It's designed to enable, you know, our rules allow committees to change when they meet, and the rules allow third party registration. Not, the, none of that is offside. That happened. And it's happened, you know, I have the experience, to my detriment, of people trying to do rapid heritage registrations for other buildings, and, and in those cases failing. And we've seen that throughout the history of this since the 1970s when it was adopted. So, you know, that, that was a bit of an issue for me. I want to remind Council that the integrity of the building speaks to the outside of the building as it presents in terms of its historical look. We have nothing to do with the inside of any building unless it's a public building. And uh, as far as I know, we don't have any of those registered at all. It's the outside of the building. That's it, not external. Uh, as far as the foundation piece goes, if uh, Dalhousie's uh, uh, building services staff want me to come by, I'll bring my cold chisel and my my mallet and uh, and my trowels, and I'll show you how I did my foundation. It took three days. Uh, it had foam in it when we bought it. it. Took us about ten years to get around to replacing it. It's uh, not the hardest thing in the world to do, uh, but my contention to council is that while there may be policy issues, you are correct, Deputy Mayor. That's not what's before us. You know, we I would love to have a conversation with Dalhousie or any institutional owner or any heritage property owner to talk about how both our policy that we control and the Heritage Property Act should be reconsidered. 
that's not what's before us today and I feel that the process has been followed as it is laid out and while I understand that Dalhousie has its concerns I'm going to support the committee and ask this council to do the same thank you thank you councillor Austin uh, thank you mr. mayor so I have three things so I mean the my the first thing for me is you know some of uh, you know when I take Dal's point you know the concern about like how are they going to grow as a campus Dal's incredibly important to us as our other universities are um, you know but as we kind of heard on the when they were in previously talking about the 35 uh, potential registrations uh, that whole process uh, there's not a campus plan right now for expansion and you know if if you're out buying houses, this is this is an established residential zone. It, just like any property owner, if you're out buying property that uh, doesn't support the zoning for what you might want to do with it in the future, I mean, it's it's buyer beware. Um, and so, I mean, I don't. Th I think to me, all of that is important, but I don't think that is really germane to actually what we're talking about today, which is is 1245 Edward Street. The property we should be registering is it historically significant? Um, you know, looking at the condition. I mean, I live in an 1870s house. Um, you know, as I was kind of looking at some of the photos, thinking, "Geez, I better go get the bulldozer for my own property because I've got rotten window sills on the front, and uh, my foundation has got some flaws in it as well." This is the nature of old properties. After time, they are not uh, immaculate, and uh, the condition of this one. I mean, I'm I'm just not convinced that this that we're at the point that this is well, geez, it's way too far gone. This is a teardown. This property could be brought back um, if, there, if there was a will and a want to, to do that. So the, the piece I, that I want to go back to our staff for is uh, the, the, the reference that Dow in their presentation, they talked about, um, well, this property shouldn't, it's not historically significant because it's in a collection of styles. A mongrel of styles was, uh, was the reference. Um, and there seemed to be an, uh, an idea in there that, you know, uh, for, for something to be historically significant, you want like this pure kind of Queen Anne or a pure kind of Second Empire or whatever this, or, you know, cra arts and crafts or whatever the architectural style is. And, you know, I've always heard that, you know, that some of the discussion on heritage when I was there is that buildings evolve and change with time and that too is part of our built heritage. Uh, and I'm wondering, like, there seems to be a very stark difference of opinion on that point and I'm wondering if we can have some commentary on just some advice for council on that particular point. Uh, uh, thanks for the question uh, through the Mr. Mayor. Uh, staff did review the, um, the report that was submitted by uh, Plus VG Architects and uh, there was a, a low score given for Victorian eclecticism. And we, we, I did research Victorian eclecticism. You do a Google search, there's lots of academic literature on Victorian eclecticism of the late uh, 1880s, 1890s, and uh, fur furniture design, architectural design. It's a, is very much a, uh, a part of our Canadian heritage. Um, Alan Pacey's famous book, Homes of Nova Scotia, has a whole, uh, whole section on Victorian eclecticism. Um, as I mentioned, uh, City Hall is, is uh, part of that architectural tradition. It, it blends six different architectural styles. Um, it's not common, you wouldn't see a building like City Hall um, in, in the United Kingdom. It's not as common in the United Kingdom or France where they, were, they, they, they took a more dogmatic approach to style. Um, they were less, less um, interested in mixing different styles together, but it's very, it was very much a Canadian thing to do. And, and, uh, and in the United States as well, it's, it's very, very common to kind of mix, mix different styles together. I think uh, City Hall is a mix of um, Regent style, um, Italianate, Gothic, and Second Empire, uh, just to name a few. So Victorian eclecticism is, is very, very prevalent in, uh, in the academic literature for uh, for heritage, and you can do a Google search for it. Uh, read, read the Wikipedia page on uh, Victorian eclectic architecture, and it's it's very much uh, um, part of our architectural history. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, so, I mean, the way, of course, our process works, you know, staff gives a recommendation to Heritage Advisory. There's a range of points in each category, and then the committee does their work, and then we get the recommendation up here at council. Um, I, I haven't done the math. Uh, did the staff suggested scores by category get to 50 points? 
I know you give a range, but like uh, where where the staff totals landed, was it was it in the favor of recommendation? Uh, thank you for the question uh, through, through the mayor. Um, that, that is correct. We do give a, a range of scoring, um, pr provide that sort of context to the Heritage Advisory Committee, uh, and it does come out at a high range and a low range, and uh, and that, that range did fall within um, the the 50 points required for a positive recommendation to regional council. The low range and the high range? Um, well, I'd have to um, go back and check. I don't know. I, yeah. I, it's, it's difficult to do the math, but certainly, certainly the high range was definitely within those uh, in, okay. in that criteria. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Seamus. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and um, you know, thank you to staff and to Dalhousie for the presentations. You know, I think there is a lot we need to talk about in regards to our heritage preservation in this city. Um, you know, as a graduate of Dalhousie, um, you know, one of the allures for me, of course, was was the city of Halifax as well as the campus itself. Yeah. And um, you know the heritage buildings that we have, they are what create a, a sense of place. They're a reflection of our history, and they're part of the identity of, of Halifax itself. You know, as we like keep chiseling away at our heritage properties, um, our intact heritage streetscapes continue to become diminished. But I don't think that is a reason for saying that this this house in its unique format is not part of the hist historical landscape because I think it very much is. In fact, I think the unusual buildings are the most interesting ones because they tell a unique story. Um, you know, a, a unique a unique story of and, and a unique point of interest. And um, you know, I think they are something to be valued and and, and preserved and not um, you know. A, called mongrels. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'm also a, a graduate of the School of Planning uh, from Dalhousie and, you know, took many, I took heritage courses when I was there. I, I actually won a, an award for a heritage paper I wrote. And we often talk in that school about the importance of heritage and place. You look at cities around the world, like like Warsaw and Poland stuck out to me in particular in my memory um, from reconstructing a city from scratch to preserve its identity. And Halifax is unique in that you know when as you move across the country, like we're old, like we're one of the oldest cities, built cities, you know, built pieces of of the country. Um, in, in terms of our built heritage. And it is a lot of wood construction and, and, that's, and that's really kind of you know, what's unique about us. Um, there's a lot of interesting rehabilitation happening with heritage buildings um, and it is genuine. It, it is, it's, this isn't faux. Faux is when you build a building to look like something old as opposed to finding an adaptive reuse for an existing building and bringing it back to life. And you know, I'm just thinking about the buildings in Lunenburg that have recently been rehabilitated and just how important they are to that town and you know, part of why it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it is a labor of love, 100%. I used to live in a house that was built in 1870 and it was lovingly restored by the previous owners, had a new foundation put on it, um, as much of the interior was preserved as possible, and, and, it's, um, and you know, it's, it's a wonderful modern home now to live in. You know, we were, the, the previous owners were really able to uh, you know, rehabilitate it in that way. And I think there's an, a learning opportunity here, as well as a different way of looking at how we take our buildings and and instead of demolish them, find new life for them. There's an environmental factor in that as well and a different way of thinking about how we live in this place. Um, I agree that the process is not perfect, particularly um, about how we engage the public and um, property owners when there's third-party registrations. I think that, we, you know, we do need to do some work on that, but we've been working with the tools uh, that we've been able to create in order to start preserving buildings because the alternative is that people are just tearing them down everywhere and we have to draw a line in the sand somewhere to say okay you know uh, enough is enough we need we need to 
look at a different way of preserving our built heritage. Um, so I, I understand uh, the grievances around that, and in particular, you know, the amount of time that we work with the property owners on on the registration piece. Um, but I do have to go with the recommendation that is in front of us now. And I really hope that you know, Dalhousie would take this opportunity to look at how they can work with a heritage building and also work with the city in a building that, is an, you know, that does need a lot of rehabilitation to it, you know, how we can help make those things happen in a way that makes sense for both the property owner um, and for our city as a whole. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. And as a member of the Heritage Advisory Committee, I did take a little offense in some of the comments that were made. Uh, we did think by process and by legislative authority. And we met online so people weren't rushing to a meeting. They were able to do it, the convenience from their own home to, 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 to attend this meeting. There's also a member of the Heritage Advisory Committee who works with Dalhousie University. She excused herself as a conflict of interest, but I'm pretty sure the university had ample opportunity to be aware and know of the processes that were unfolding for this particular property. In regards to the Edward Street uh, situation, uh, what the future use of the Dalhousie may be doing with the property, you know, it sounds like they just want to raise, raise the building and put a parking lot in, but I really think that you should look at your development potential because with a heritage property, you have more density opportunities than you do with a blank empty lot. So I think that uh, th things like that should be considered. If you're still uh, the uh, angst to have the building removed, uh, perhaps you may want to have some discussions with Heritage uh, Nova Scotia to see the possibility of relocating the building because we've had seen other relocations of Heritage buildings in this, in this municipality in the past. So it's always an option. Instead of losing it, you can relocate it. And uh, I really think that those things should be considered. For the meantime, I'll be supporting the recommendation of our, of our, of our committee as it stands forward, and uh, look forward to uh, further debate and discussion on future uh, heritage buildings in our municipality. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, colleagues, uh, to uh, Seamus, uh, thank you for the work, and to the committee, thank you, and to Dal for your presentation. Uh, my questions were, and I think it was already asked, though, about the, the, the Seamus, the difference in the rating. I think it was 64 over 100 versus Dow's uh, heritage person, 34 over 100. I mean, that, that, that's quite a difference. And I wonder if you could, I know you spoke to it earlier, but if you could speak to that again, that would be helpful. When, when the committee looks at these requests for heritage status, you know, there is the process, and we've heard quite clearly there may be an opportunity in the near future to be looking at that process, but, you know, what does the committee want? Want to accomplish? I don't know if you can. You know, I'm, I always struggle with this heritage piece because we, as we grow, and I think in the past it's fair to say there have been mistakes in the past where we've lost buildings that we shouldn't have lost. Uh, you know, have we kept buildings that we shouldn't keep? And I guess that that's the discussion on the on the floor today. Uh, the other question I have, Seamus, is that, and Councillor uh, Mason alluded to this, we don't look at the inside of the building, but in your experience, uh, you know, have we uh, applied heritage status to buildings uh, to save and preserve the outside where the inside was in in bad shape or a mix of use. Have we had ex experiences of that you know, in other situations? Those are my few questions, and then I have a couple of comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the three questions. I think I've captured uh, most of them uh, through, the, through the mayor. Um, and just getting back to the question that was posed earlier about the, the scoring, the low versus the, the high range that was supplied to the Heritage Advisory Committee, we did, a colleague of mine did uh, whisper in my ear that the low, the low scoring that, that staff provided would, would have been around 53 points out of 100. Yes. Okay. So that was, that yeah. was, the, uh, uh, was calculated for me there. Uh, in terms of the, the question about the, the difference between the uh, plus VGA uh, evaluation and the Heritage Advisory Committee's evaluation, um, plus VGA focused a lot on the condition of the building, um, the, the historical associations, and the um, architectural style, and gave, gave very low uh, points for all three of those categories. Um, but you look at those same things, but uh, there's a different weighting, is that fair to that, say? That, that's, that's correct, yeah. The, the uh, plus VGA gave very low score for historic associations because uh, Ru Rudolph, um, 
Hobrecker was not his father. He was the son of the father, and the father was very significant. Um, the the Boke family member as well was was part of a family, and uh, and, and the larger family didn't didn't reside in that in that property. It was the it was the uh, um, other members of the family. Um, there was also the, the architectural style was given an extremely low score by the the, the um, plus VGA, uh, not recognizing Victorian eclecticism mm -hmm. as a genuine architectural style, when in fact um, uh, it, it indeed is a, a part of our Canadian heritage that style and it's exemplary in Alan Penny's book no Homes of Nova Scotia that we reference uh, regularly. Um, and uh, the other criteria, I believe, was integrity. Um, a lot of weight was put on condition, um, where, whereas when, when staff evaluate integrity of a building, we, we follow the, uh, the um, Appleton Charter, um, the national standards definition of integrity, and our HRM evaluation criteria uses that, uh, that, that standard that integrity is not just about condition. So it's safe to say that we're not comparing apples with apples. It's, it's a different criteria that's being applied. So uh, uh, use that as a... Uh, yeah. As, a, uh, as a point of uh, reference, it's really not fair because there are two different criteria that are being used. I believe the, the criteria were understood differently from by, yeah. by PLUS VGA and the Heritage Advisory Committee. Uh, okay. uh, in terms of the question around what does HAC try to accomplish with a heritage registration, uh, I believe HAC tries to ensure that the, any building or uh, property that is included on the heritage registry belongs there. That it, that it, that it is truly part of our, our heritage, that it, 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 it's an exemplary part of our heritage and that it, it, it is worthy of investments through our grant programs, it is worthy of protection through, uh, through our land use regulations. Um, and that it that truly belongs there. Men, m properties go before the Heritage Advisory Committee, and if, if they're not successful, they simply don't come to Regional Council. That's something that right. the Council may not be aware of. Uh, uh, council does not, uh, I mean, the HAC does not provide ne negative recommendations for registration right. to Council. It simply stops at HAC, so, so a Council doesn't have the advantage of seeing the properties that are um, turned down by right. regional council. And it does happen um, every year. Uh, properties are turned Do you have down a by the heritage advisor. Best guess. Uh, yeah. a, 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 a small percentage, yeah. okay. one, one or two a year. Okay. But um, there, there are properties that are brought forward that are turned down and simply don't make it before regional council because the HAC feels that it that it doesn't meet the the, the evaluation criteria. Um, in, in terms of the the third question uh, through the mayor again about the uh, the interior of. Uh, uh, of um, heritage buildings, um, and the, the legislation, the Heritage Property Act, is is very uh, particular to the exterior of the building, um, and it's, it's it's simply it, and it's not to say that the interior of heritage buildings is not important. Um, heritage staff recognizes the interior as being important. We just don't have the the the, the tools uh, and, the, and the, the, ena the enabling tools under the, her the heritage legislation to enter the interior or to consider anything in the interior to be of heritage value, uh, but we, we, we always encourage property owners to maintain the interior um, uh, you know, outside the confines of the Heritage Property Act. Um, a, a property can be completely gutted in the interior. All of the uh, defining features in the, in, the, in the interior of a registered heritage property can be removed and, uh, and new, new um, layouts can, 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 be, can happen and it's and part of, the, and it is part of uh, helping um, uh, adaptive reuse. The fact that you can do, uh, you have, you have uh, an, an immense amount of creativity in terms of what you can do in the interior of the building um, to find a new use for that building. Um, it can be, you can turn a residential building into offices for, 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 uh, for, for a university. You can turn it into a clinic, um, mm. but because, you, because you, you're free to do whatever you want in the interior, as long as you maintain, maintain the exterior um, uh, appearance of the envelope, and, and, the, and the features on the on the exterior, um, it's a way of enabling that uh, that kind of uh, modern use modern uses of, of older buildings. Thank you very much. No, you have to come back if you have anything else, yeah, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to Seamus and the Heritage staff and to Dow for their presentations. Um, I am a member of the Heritage Advisory Committee as well. And when I saw this particular building um, on our screen, I looked at it as a very beautiful building. Um, it needs some work um, that's noted, but I think 
with the avail uh, sorry with the availability of grants that are that can be applied for much of the work can be done so as um, Councillor Austin mentioned, and Councillor Mason, um, a lot of these skings will take an easy fix to keep the integrity of the outer um, portion of the building. Um, you've already answered one of my questions, and that was, does the grant cover only the exterior, uh, and does it cover any of the interior? So. It's, that's good to know. But as you said, you know, we can use the interior in different ways. So as long as we maintain the exterior, we're good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, Seamus, for giving some clarification um, from the perspective of staff in this. I, I find this very difficult. This is not an easy um, decision by any means, even loving and valuing our heritage properties in Halifax and acknowledging that it makes Halifax so special and Halifax is a very old city. Um, I, the, the fact that the property owners um, lack of support is, is so disregarded in these, uh, these decisions is, is very concerning. Um, I, I really appreciated the correspondence that Dal did send. I, the, the discrepancy between the two reports I found very interesting and to read both both sides kind of making their arguments for the scores that they gave, uh, very interesting. I don't have a problem with a university buying up property for future vision, like future vision exercises, e even if it's not known at, at this time, where, what else are they supposed to do with a growing campus, a, a growing student body? And I mean, we all remember, it didn't happen too long ago, the, the lack of housing available for students and telling international students to stay at home, there's, there's no place for you to live here. And just the crisis that ensues when there's just not enough places. So um, it's not unreasonable to look 10, 20 years down the road and think, well, perhaps this, this property could be rezoned to accommodate for a building that could house lots of students. Um, so, have, yeah, um, there is a lack of developable land. Uh, there is a need for accessible and sustainable campuses, uh, all of our universities. And, um, uh, yeah, I'm just not sure about this one. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Um, and I just want to certainly thank Seamus and the work that you've done with the Heritage Committee members as well. Uh, a particular uh, um, thanks that I want to offer, though, is to Dalhousie. You know, I think it's worth noting that you really, Dalhousie really has been a leader in, his, in, in historical preservation. It needs to be said and it needs to be celebrated. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, those to see those photos in the in the report and and of the of the major um, uh, features of Dalhousie campus that have been protected at a time likely when uh, others weren't doing the, the same. So they should be commended for that. I. I do have uh, certainly an appreciation as well for the historical significance of this particular property. I too am conflicted a bit because of the, um, uh, uh, the, all, of the all of the submissions that have been sent to us. In particular though, what's standing out to me right now is the couple of things, is the discrepancy between um, you know, roughly 32 out of 100 with a different paper, perhaps a different set of lens and parameters by which they reviewed it, and a 64 out of 100, which frankly is not very high according, by our policies perspectives as well. To me, that's not very high, uh, That, uh, but it's policy that we do have to abide by, and I understand that. The, um, the other piece that I have concerns about is, is uh, Councillor, Purdy alluded to it, but I, I have to disagree just a little bit that while I know that um, Dalhousie, you presented that you, you don't have a plan for this property and the fact that the, the 
the university doesn't have a growth plan, and the and the current crisis that we're in around housing stock. You know, this is a building that even if it were approved, there are still options, and options in a time when the university students, in my opinion, are still struggling. They still don't have enough housing. My own kids don't have housing. I just moved one into my house on the weekend. <laughs> and that's very real. That's not going away tomorrow. That will be here, I think, for years for us. I struggle strongly with the notion of, of demolishing something that could be adapted. And, and I think that in this case, I hope, I, I'd like to encourage whatever way this goes, that Dalhousie will look at this as more of an opportunity. I like the language adaptive reuse. We have asked many Heritage Property Act owners, downtown Halifax are perfect examples of facades that are, are retained and beautiful new uh, state-of-the-art buildings are built in behind. That to me is a far better option going forward in a crisis of space for potential, whether it's potential housing stock or potential opportunity for Dalhousie to, to grow. It is still a worthwhile asset, I think. Um, I'm still a little on the fence. I'm still open to hearing other options for it. But I, 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 I again, I, I look forward to actually having, being part of the debate around potential policy ad adaptations maybe within the Heritage Act, that Heritage um, Committee and, and the policies that HRM have so that we, we don't do this because this is a really <laughs> difficult example of really good stewards of, the, of heritage in our, our city who are at odds with our policies. It's difficult in this particular case. I hope we all wake up to the reality of um, that kind of uh, dilemma around, you know, where where it, it makes sense when you when when it was spoken of uh, that that there's no great purpose, for, there's no particular benefit to retaining it, but I think that benefit actually lands back with you with that Dehazi, that that's because there's no plan for anything else to further uh, put for put forward something further on a parcel that really could still be worthwhile. So for now, I'm leaning towards supporting it. Um, I'm still open to hearing more, but uh, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Deagle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the 64 versus the 32. Um, I had asked the, the question of Dal, and so uh, thank you to my colleagues who have followed up with the uh, asking shame as you about this as well. And, you know, Councillor Mancini said, you know, it's not comparing apples to apples. And when I read both reports, um, you know, I had to read it the second time to actually understand about are we comparing the same thing? Um, and so have you, and I understand that we're not, I understand that that the consultant um, for Dow has applied the criteria in a different way than uh, you know, the heritage uh, staff have. Have you ever seen such a discrepancy between your work and, and I'm just, I'm wondering if you've ever seen that discrepancy before. Um, I'll say that I'm not conflicted. I will support the motion as it is. I think the fact that there is an absence of a plan um, makes a difference to me. I think that if we had heard a little bit differently that it was going to be this or, or that, or it was going to be adaptive for use, but I do think that it having the heritage designation is, as my colleagues, uh, Councillor Kent has said, it is an opportunity to for an adaptive reuse, and um, I like that all of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, just curiosity about if you've ever seen such a distinct difference between both. Thank you for the question through you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Aaron Murnahan, Principal Heritage Planner. I have a bit of a sore throat, so I apologize. I'll try and get through this. <clears throat> um, on the one hand, I, I don't believe we've ever had uh, this type of an analysis of, uh, of a scoring before <clears throat> by a professional. So in that way, this is a bit of a unique case. Um, but I would say that um, 
you know, we are in the process of reviewing the, thank you very much, the evaluation criteria that we're using. Um, so we do recognize that, you know, it hasn't changed in a very long time. Uh, the other real issue, though, is consistency. And I would say that uh, this score of 64 points falls completely in line with uh, other scores of similar buildings that have been brought forward in the past five years. I would also say that Seamus and myself are both uh, accredited members of the, the Association of uh, Heritage Professionals, uh, to which uh, this gentleman who wrote the critique is also a member. Okay. Um, we are very much qualified to, uh, to make these types of analysis. And I would also say that because we work in the, the context of, of this city uh, you know, on a daily basis, that we are definitely more uh, adept at making those types of analysis than, uh, than the person who was hired by VG+. Is there anything that you would take from this unique situation um, that you think? So here's something that I've learned. I'm going to bring it forward to the next time when we're looking at these heritage designations like this. It's, I think especially <clears throat> in terms of thinking about the style, right? That seems to stand out for me. So. Uh, through the mayor, <clears throat> I, think, I think Seamus captured it quite well that Halifax does have quite a unique uh, architectural typology that I think needs to be celebrated and is likely not fully understood by the architect that was hired to do this critique. But I will say that whenever we face this type of a heritage, it's probably one of the longest heritage hearings that I've sat through in the last six years. <laughs> yes. uh, I will say that it gives us as staff uh, lots to think about as we do reviews of both our processes and our policies. And uh, this will definitely give us something to think about. Again, though, this is very much uh, consistent how this report was done, how this uh, process unfolded uh, uh, was done quite consistently with other, other applications that we've handled, just with the one exception of moving the date of that uh, yes. Heritage Advisory Committee yes. uh, hearing or the, uh, the meeting date. Okay. Um, and that's completely within the purview of that committee uh, in concert with the clerk's office to make those decisions. So, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Outhead. Thank you, Mayor, and I'll second the motion. This is probably the, one of the longest ones I've been in as well. Um, so I'll, I will try and be quick, Mr. Murray. Glad to hear that. I, uh, I have a question for staff while they're there. I, um, I, you know, looking back at this, I've been on council for a while now, and I've been pretty supportive, and folks have mentioned this about heritage. Uh, zones, districts, buildings, etc. And uh, folks have recognized that. And recently I brought forward one myself, a third party uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Bedford and uh, a building that I thought uh, turned out to be the third oldest building in Bedford. And I think that was, uh, was absolutely worth saving and I thank the committee staff and council for supporting that. What gnaws at me about this one and where I'm just wondering, this isn't a heritage Conf uh, conservation district like Smithville, Smithville, et cetera. And, you know, I went to Dow many years ago and we had religious studies house and history house and English house and poli sci house on, on Seymour and Edward and Vernon and et cetera, et cetera, La Marchant, other streets. And they were in pretty good shape. They wouldn't meet today's standards as, as folks have said for accessibility and this sort of thing. My question for you is this house, which has been um, brought forward by a neighbor. Is it really that unique or different from all those other beautiful houses on those streets? So not, and that's kind of a funny question, except that, you know, if this should be a heritage conservation district, then let's, let's start talking about that. If it's going to be, well, this one's a little bit older, or this one's got a different window, or this one had a more interesting character living in it than this one, and we're going to go through this, house by house, street by street, I, I don't know that that's productive or fair. So my question, and, and I expect it's a little unusual, is this house so unique to the neighborhood the way that house on the Bedford Highway was, and it was the third oldest house in Bedford, is it that unique? Uh, thank you for the question through the, through the mayor. Um, this, this building was identified as one of the oldest buildings yeah. on, on Edward Street. Yeah. Um, it, in terms of its architectural style, um, much of the other buildings along that portion of, of, uh, of um, Edward Street, and uh, we determined that there was approximately 16 other um, mm -hmm. 
wood, uh, wooden buildings from the 19th, early 20th yeah. century within visual range exactly. of, uh, of, this, of this building. Exactly. Uh, th this one um, does stand out architecturally from okay. the, the other, okay. what we would describe as late Victorian plain architecture. Uh, this one does have an, a more eclectic style um, where with, with prominent features such as the, uh, the double bay windows and tower, okay. uh, tower yeah. form, yeah. The, 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 the prominent brackets under the eaves, the mansard roof. So th this one is, um, uh, contributes to the, the character and almost sustains the character of that streetscape between, uh, between those two streets. Um, and, and, it, and it's right in the middle of the block, so yeah. it can right in the middle of the block. It's almost yeah. like a, an architectural crest um, when you went, compared to the other, the other uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, historic buildings that right. form that streetscape. And that's important to be reminded because, I mean, to me, it's a wonderful neighborhood. I have an old house, like others have mentioned they have, and, and they're, they're wonderful. But I look up and down that street and I see a lot of interesting old homes uh, that might be worthy of protection, but I don't have your training, obviously. Uh, so I wanted to ask what you th what you thought about the uniqueness of this house, unless you know, and at some point, if you think the whole street should have some type of designation, well, then bring it forward and we'll kick it around. Yeah. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll just add that you know I, I give some lectures at Dell sometimes, Dell Planning School around uh, heritage properties. And I sh usually show them a map of Halifax in 1878, and it's the city is much smaller and it's surrounding the, the harbor. Um, and I, I often say, you know, any building that is on this map that still exists today should really be registered. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, we don't simply look at age alone, but yeah. one of the reasons why us as staff exist in this position and the Heritage Advisory Committee exists is to retain the character of, of our communities. Um, and as we see, you know, going up and down Roby Street or going up and down Coburg Road, the, uh, the missing teeth that now exist there, um, each one of these buildings adds to that character. Yeah. But the only way that we can process those uh, in a timely fashion, in a way that works with the resources that we have, the small amount of resources that we have, is through these one-off applications for the most part. Yeah. Heritage uh, conservation districts can take several years to yeah, create, yeah. and we can only really do one at a time, and we're working through those based on you know, the areas of highest value first. Uh, but uh, this is really the only way that we can do it. I would say any building on that street that is over 130 years old should probably or could qualify for registration, but we okay. simply don't have an or, uh, a way to do that. All right, and that's important information. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Thanks, Russell. Staff. Thank you very much. I am also conflicted on this one. Um, I recognize that there's a difference uh, when a building reaches a certain age, uh, there's a difference between an old building and a heritage building. And I'm not sure where uh, where things stand with this one. We normally get the property owner coming here and they normally have a reason to uh, seek heritage status. Um, and what they're going to do with the building is generally try and restore it uh, and generally try and, and do something with it. We have obviously seen, because they've applied for a demolition permit, uh, that Dalhousie is, is not interested in uh, restoring this building or, or doing something else with it. The other thing that caught my attention is this is one building next to a number of other buildings. So we have, um, which most buildings are, but uh, they, stress that point that they bought this property because they own the property next to it. Now that they own this property, would they be interested in buying 1231, 1233, 1235, and 1239 uh, Edward Street and turning the whole thing into an apartment building? It is a potential, but I don't, I don't know. Um, it didn't seem that we would be able to get an answer to that question. What I'm wondering, is, when, uh, again, back to the idea that normally a property owner brings the property here, um, and, and they normally see benefit from uh, the heritage registration, and they normally try and make use of that. In this case, it seems to be exactly the opposite. Uh, they will not want the heritage registration. They will not want the grants. They will not want to do any of the restoration. What are the obligations that uh, Dalhousie would be under if this becomes a heritage building? Will they have to restore it? Can they just leave it there? Will they be able to let it fall down? Um, what are they required to do? Uh, 
Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, due to the some of the weaknesses of the Heritage Property Act, there is no obligation. Um, so they can either apply to demolish the day after uh, this property becomes officially uh, registered, for which there is a process uh, that they would have to go through, which includes public consultation, or they can simply wait under Section 18 for three years uh, and demolish it after that time. But while the building is registered, there is no obligations to retain uh, the building's condition or to maintain it in any way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a, a quick question. Um, the ability to make these third party applications, that, that rests with the Heritage Property Act, correct? It's the act that outlines a third person can swoop in and make these applications. So any changes would have to go through the Provincial Heritage Property Act, correct? Uh, through the mayor, th that is correct. It is the the right. Provincial Heritage Property Act uh, provides that ability for municipalities to, to register third party applications. So I think unfortunately this is a, a case of don't hate the player, hate the game. Um, you know, uh, we really have our hands tied on this one because we followed all of our processes. Um, and you know, under, under the provincial rules, a third party can make these applications. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And just a couple of things in regards to other heritage advisory hearings. I think the Memorial Church, the North End of Halifax, we've seen it twice in this chamber. The first time the developer, the owner didn't want it registered and we voted it down. Second time, the change of ownership, the new owner comes back and wants to register it. So this is not unique in regards to having an extended debate on heritage properties. Um, but in regards to the comment about the zero versus one, uh, yes, was one application back with New Brunswick Street uh, application where it was zero uh, score because we didn't know. But I said at that time in the committee was, we should not be assigning zero because just because we don't know who the builder is, there's still significance that building was built and still standing. And that's why we felt that a, a point, at least a point should be given. And there's, and there's circumstances where we don't know who the constructor may be because saying zero says there's no value at all. I think there is value in heritage is still standing and that's why we got to give it a one so there therefore uh, like I said uh, that was rational for that and I've always said that uh, you always pay for what you get one consultant may say one thing or another consultant may say another so the Dalhousie's report can be taken with a grain of salt as well and in regards to the the, the expertise and advice of our staff uh, I, would, I would put them up against anyone any day thank you thank you there's nobody else ready for the question. That motion is carried. Thank you. Thank uh, Dalhousie for being here. Colleagues, we're going to move right to our next heritage hearing, which is a request to include 65 Tulip Street in the Registry of Heritage Property. We, uh, all right. We'll just take a second, colleagues. All right, folks, can I have your attention? Oh. Folks, we're going to carry on. Uh, this one is probably going to be just as long, so uh, I welcome you. The floor is yours. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I promise this will be much shorter, actually. <laughs> So uh, I am, uh, sorry, thank you Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is Jenny Lugar. I am a heritage planner with the Heritage Property Program. And this is case uh, or H00529, which is uh, 65 Tulip Street in Dartmouth. Oh, sorry. Oh shoot. <laughs> 
So in January 2022, the property owner applied to include their 65 Tulip Street property in the Registry of Heritage Property for the Halifax Regional Municipality. The property owner will not be attending the heritage hearing today, but are supportive of the application. The subject property is located on the western side of Tulip Street in Dartmouth, on the block between Beach and Oak Streets, as shown on map one on this slide. The property is located just west of Sullivan's Pond Park in a neighborhood that's variously called the Flower Streets or Austinville. The property contains a two and a half story, uh, sorry, one and a half story dwelling. At their July 2022 meeting, the Heritage Advisory Committee evaluated the property at 65 Tulip Street using the six evaluation criteria shown above. I'll go through each of these criteria and summarize the property's qualities and then outline the score awarded by HAC at the end of the presentation. So the first category is age. Uh, residential development of the Austinville area began in the mid to late 19th century when James Austin sold lots for $100 to local carpenters and tradesmen. The lot for 65 Tulip Street appears as lot 30 in the Austinville subdivision from the mid 19th century. A structure at 65 Tulip Street is visible on the Hopkins 1878 map. Based on this and the presence of building materials that were popularly used prior to 1880 but fell out of use following 1880, uh, it's estimated that the house was built in or shortly before 1878. The second category is historical importance. Uh, so the house at 65 Tulip Street is very representative of working class residential growth and industrial development in Dartmouth in the mid to late 19th century. The house is intimately related to the Gates family, um, variously spelled Gates, uh, the two different versions showed here, which are all pronounced Gates. Um, members of the Gates family immigrated to Nova Scotia in 1751, and then John Gates, who was born in 1817, later had five children, which included uh, Archibald Geshen Gates and Albert Gates. All the male children in the family were carpenters or painters. Archibald Geshen Gates was the designer and builder of 65 Tulip Street, while Albert Gates resided in the house. Albert Gates' descendants owned the house for 81 years following its construction. The Gates family, as a family of builders, carpenters, and painters, likely contributed significantly to the streetscapes still found around downtown Dartmouth, both in the Flower Streets neighborhood and in others. There are several houses that are known to have been designed and built by members of the family, and several others that are suspected to have been built and designed by members of the family. Skill and craftsmanship of builders in the family is well documented in the interior details at 65 Tulip Street, as are shown on this slide. These are uh, images submitted by the property owner and applicant. As a member of the working class, the family largely remains a uh, little documented in history. However, Albert Gates and his family made notable contributions to the construction of 19th century neighborhoods in Dartmouth, uh, very much including this one, and many of, many of which neighborhoods are still standing today. So the third category is the significance of the architect or builder. Uh, as noted earlier, the property was designed by Archibald Geshun Gates, who was often referred to in historical record as A.G. Gates. Gates is credited for designing and building several Dartmouth houses, including the three shown on this slide here, 11, 12, and 13 Tulip Street, which are at the other end of uh, Tulip Street. Uh, Gates would have been locally renowned at the time, uh, especially in Dartmouth, as a designer and builder of homes in the neighborhood. The fourth category is architectural merit. Uh, first, we look at construction type. So the house at 65 Tulip Street, shown in the photo here uh, from the 1960s, is built of wood frame construction. This is a common type of construction during this period. Building materials, um, for instance, wrought cut nails, have been found by the residents, which indicate that the house was built prior to 1880 as uh, wrought cut nails were, were soon transitioned out of uh, building practices. Uh, next, we look at architectural merit for the style of the building. So the house is considered a vernacular workers' cottage unique to, Austin, unique to the Austinville area from this period in the mid to late 19th century. The style has uh, influences from various architectural styles, including Italianate, Gothic Revival, Second Empire, Stick, and Shingle. There are only very select examples of this style in Austinville in the, neighbor, in the Flower Streets neighborhood that remain intact, including 15 Pine Street, which is uh, registered heritage property, and 43 Dahlia Street, which are shown here, both shown here. 
There are several examples uh, within the neighborhood of Austinville style cottages uh, which have been significantly modified, show, uh, including the removal of dormers, substantial roof line changes, and adjustments to window size and placement, as you can see with many of, many of the homes here uh, in these images. Uh, finally, the character-defining elements of this residence include its wood cladding, a three-sided dormer, and symmetrical windows on the front facade. Uh, given that this style can only be found in its original condition in two other examples in the Austinville area, it is considered quite rare. The fifth category is architectural integrity. The house at 65 Tulip Street has a high level of architectural integrity. Its original one and a half story cottage form and front facade remain intact with uh, windows and the entrance in the original locations. Modest modifications that have been made to the house over time, uh, likely during the 1960s and 70s, include uh, modification of the dormer from a five-sided Scottish style dormer to a three-sided sided gable roof dormer. We know this because the property owner, upon doing uh, some restoration work to that dormer, did find evidence that it was originally a Scottish dormer. Facing of the fieldstone foundation with concrete parging and construction of a small square addition to the rear of the building which is not visible from the front of the building. Uh, our final category is the relationship to the surrounding area. So 65 Tulip Street is one of a uh, few remaining Austinville, Austinville style vernacular workers cottages in the surrounding area and one of even fewer with strong architectural integrity. Most of the examples of this form of house that can be found on the 1878 Hopkins map have either been lost or significantly modified over time. Given that this style is highly representative of industrial development and the construction of workers' housing in the 19th century in Dartmouth, the building is considered strong rela strongly related to its surrounding area. 65 Tulip Street shares a block with a variety of other residences, including a 15-story building built in the mid-20th century, shown in this photo on the slide, and other mid to late 20th century uh, low-rise dwellings. It's an important feature in the streetscape um, as the only home from the original Austinville subdivision, which remains in the immediate vicinity. And finally, of course, it's uh, notably linked to 11, 12, and 13 Tulip Street, which were also designed by the designer and builder A.G. Gates. When HAC evaluated the property, they uh, awarded a score, a total of 58 points for 65 Tulip Street out of a possible uh, 100 points, uh, which led to the positive recommendation before you. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, indeed. Question of clarification, Councillor Mancini? Nope, no. sorry, no. Mr. Mayor. I don't, that was no questions of clarification. Okay, now we're gonna move quickly here. Uh, I'm gonna open the heritage hearing, but we don't have, the property owner's not here, correct? So, I'm gonna ask for a motion to close it. Moved by Councillor Austin, seconded by Councillor Deputy Mayor Lovelace, Councillor Mason. All those uh, in favor of closing the public hearing, the heritage hearing, pardon me. Uh, all right, um, we will go to Councillor, uh, Austin, who I expect knows this area well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, I, I do indeed. I will move that Halifax Regional Council approve the request to include 65 Tulip Street, Dartmouth in the Registry of Heritage Properties for the Halifax Regional Municipality as shown on map one of the July 4th, 2022 report as a municipal heritage property under the Heritage Property Act. Councillor Cleary, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and just quickly, uh, obviously in support. It's much easier when, uh, they, when everyone is on the same page in terms of the of property owner uh, and municipality and heritage community, everybody on this one. Um, it's, a, it's a property I know well. I think I pass this house basically every day when I take the dog for a walk since uh, I'm on the next block over. Um, I wanted to just put a quick plug out. Um, for the property owner, I stopped them the other day on the street and got their permission to say this. And uh, uh, I don't think there's any finer uh, commitment advertisement for the Heritage Property Program than one of our own people who is working in that is actually applying. It's uh, Elizabeth Cushing who works with us is was the applicant in this case. And so that's a, a wonderful validation of the program when you see uh, staff committing their own properties, their own personal um, assets to it. So uh, wonderful to see and I thank the both of the Cushings for their contribution to Heritage in Dartmouth. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anybody else? Ready for the question? That carries. Thank you, Council. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lugar. Thank you to the Cushings. Uh, colleagues, we will take a break and we will come back at 20 minutes, 20 minutes past 3 o'clock. We're getting close to the beginning of the meeting. Uh, 20 past 3.
Okay, have we got quorum, Mr. Clerk?
All right, folks. I said we'd come back at 320, it being 328, we're getting close. All right. Uh, so I believe now we're going to go back and pick up uh, Councillor Smith on item, no? Item 10.1, which is the uh, African Descent Advisory Committee amendments. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will try again to put this on the floor. <laughs> uh, that the Halifax Regional Municipal, the Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to one adopt Administrative Order Number 2021-004, Gov, respecting African Descent Advisory Committee in in the Halifax Regional Municipality as set out in attachment one of the revised staff report dated July 6, 2022, which will advise the municipality on the impact of municipal policies, programs, and services of people of African descent, and two, adopt the proposed amendments to Administrative Order 1 as set out in attachment three of the revised staff report dated July 6, 2022, to allow the newly created African Descent Advisory Committee to report to the Executive Standing Committee of Council. Move. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Councillor Smith? Yeah, I, so really, I don't have a lot to add. So the reason why I deferred it was uh, after reading the report, I thought it would uh, really align well with the decade of people of African descent, the, the UN decade, um, and a lot of what, what was put in that report and what was asked to be focused on related to policies, programs, services, we've already aligned with our anti-racism plan, with many other plans. Uh, the, the decade of people of African descent. So uh, sitting down with staff with uh, the diversity inclusion and, and, and team, we came to the conclusion that renaming it the African Descent Advisory Committee just aligns with the broader context of the, the decade and also makes it inclusive for, for all of those uh, who are of African descent. So really that's the, the, the biggest change and um, happy that that was adopted by, by staff. Thank you, Councillor. Uh Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, agree with everything that Councillor Smith just said. Thank you so much. Um, the only change I have is I'd like to make an amendment um, to the admin order to change, sorry, I'm just looking for it, 15D to uh, update the correct spelling of Lake Loon, which is actually two words. Lake Loon slash Cherry Brook. Do I have a seconder? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I, so there was that one change. The other thing that I am uh, wondering about is the interpretation section, section two, uh, where it states that youth are identified as individuals aged between 15 and 24. And so my question uh, is, uh, I'm just looking for an understanding as to why we have chosen 15 to 24. As uh, my colleague, Councillor Stoddard, has pointed out um, to me, the United Nations uh, is 15 to 25 for their definition of youth. And our own National Youth Secretariat for the Government of Canada is 15 to 19, uh, sorry, 15 to 29. Uh, so I'm just wondering uh, if, um, if we can get an understanding of, of where that 15 to 24 came from. Do we have anybody here who can speak to that? So Same if not, right? then I will put an amendment on the floor. Just on the First Amendment. That First Amendment was friendly, I assume, yes. the correct spelling Thank of you. Lake Loon. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, yes, so then uh, what I would like to do is align our ages with the Canadian Youth Secretariat and Youth Policy for Canada, which states youth uh, that are ages 15 to 29. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. It was seconded by Councillor Cuddle. Is there discussion, anything else on that? Uh, Councillor Clary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Without uh, the benefit of having staff here to explain why we chose one 
age over another age, uh, I wonder if, because uh, I don't want to vote against it, I wonder if uh, the mover would consider asking for a, a supplemental report so that we can get some info back on why uh, and what the implications would be of any changes. There could be unintended consequences with different programs we run, et cetera. So. I just wonder if staff may be coming. Uh, uh, Councillor, Mr. Clark. Um, I have confirmed with this. The years on this AO match the same definition as in the Youth Advisory Committee, which has youth, which has the definition of youth as youth means an individual age 15 to 24 who resides in a municipality. So that would be the, the background of where that number came from. Um, and would be a comparable number to the Youth Advisory Committee. I have conferred with staff who, um, who are with the Diversity and Inclusion Office, um, and they have said that it would be okay to move those dates, but keeping the consistency is something to be as a consideration. So Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So with that um, understanding, I will withdraw uh, and, uh, and just keep that friendly amendment uh, to update Lake Loon. And thank you so much. I appreciate the work on this. Okay, so the amendment, amendment has been withdrawn. Councillor Cuddle, I'm a seconder, supports the withdrawal. So the motion is on the floor amended for the correct spelling of the amazing community of Lake Bloom. Ready for the question? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, we'll move to uh, another deferred item, which is... Uh, First reading, uh, bylaw S450, respecting charges for street improvements. Councillor, uh, is it Councillor Cuddle? Uh, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council give first reading to bylaw S450, amending bylaw S400, the street improvement bylaw, as set out in attachment one to the staff report dated September 15th, 2022. Second. Second, Councillor Stoddard. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. So um, this was originally on the consent agenda um, in September 29th, um, and uh, I asked that it uh, be removed for discussion, or be deferred. And um, the reason being that when I read this report, I was um, a, a little bit surprised to learn that the original survey to the residents for the street improvement, you know, for the, for the streets that are in the staff report here that are affected by this motion, the original survey was done in 2015 and um, the work on the streets was done in 2018, 2019, 2020, and that we hadn't invoiced the residents for the work that was completed. We haven't invoiced them yet. So it was this kind of long delay in that, you know, it's been eight years since it was agreed upon to move forward with the work, and eight years later, there's still no invoice, which is a fairly long time. And um, so I had some questions for staff about, you know, why has it taken so long, and why are the people who got their street done in 2018 um, only now about to get get an invoice. During that time, there was also a policy change um, which switched the formula from funding of 50% uh, to 33% for residents. Um, and there are other implications as well, such as the tax rate. So if the work had been invoiced back in 2018, um, the, the interest on on the uh, amount that the residents have to pay would be at that, whatever the interest rates were at that time. Uh, since then, interest rates have gone up, so there's a financial implication. There's also budgeting and planning implications. During that time, houses could have changed owners and passed hands, and so the people who originally approved the street improvement, um, you know, not even there anymore. So I, you know, I had questions about this in terms of best practice and, and you know, best business practice as a, as a municipality, like how we go about invoicing work, implications on our cash flow, um, other considerations as well. And, um, you know, through this process and discussions with staff, you know, I've learned that, you know, there, there were a few considerations here, and I'm not sure if 
Renee is here. Yep, she is. Um, I might ask her a clarifying question about that. But what I would like to do is actually put on, an, um, make a, a motion, the alternative motion that's in the staff report and put this alternative motion on the floor. Amendment, sorry. Amendment on the floor. Um, which is that attachment four of the staff report dated September 15th, 2022, bylaw S450, amending bylaw S400, and the street improvement bylaw be amended with section, th that section three is added as follows. Subsection 44 is added after subsection 43 and before section 5 in schedule AB set out below as follows. Notwithstanding subsection 43, the rate of interest for charges outstanding that are imposed under schedule AB shall be 4.45%. Um, <laughs> Second. Second by <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, so, in effect, uh, and I have to thank Renee for helping me with that because it's a lot of um, subsections and um, more subsections. Um, not the language I would have used, but essentially <laughs> what I'm trying to achieve here is, is that we, we, in, we bill the residents under existing, the existing bylaw with an interest rate reflective reflective of the time, uh, reflective of the interest rates that would have been in place at the time the work was done. So that is uh, in effect what I'm trying to achieve. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I didn't have time to bring up the staff report to look at the alternative, uh, but just very quickly uh, to Ms. Towns, what, what, what's the financial implication, I'm assuming, you know, we have access to funds at a certain rate, we're going to lend it out at another rate. So what is the differential now, the delta between what would have happened and now what will happen? Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Council. Uh, Renee Towns, I'm the Treasurer, Finance and Asset Management. Um, thank you. So uh, just even to back up a little bit around the delay, I, I would like to address that. Um, so the way these roads are paved, they are J-class roads, they are paved by the province. The province then invoices HRM for the work, HRM then passes along the cost to the customer, to the residents. Uh, so the issue here was that uh, there were a lot of staff turnover, uh, follow-up was being done to request the invoicing, but we did not receive it. So I'm not saying that as an excuse, it shouldn't have happened. Our customers, you know, they have planning to do and, and we want them to be able to budget, so I, you know, our apologies for that. Going forward, we have a plan in place, we have better contacts, We've expressed to our, our friends at the province that um, you know the importance of having this in a timely manner. So going forward, hopefully we, we don't have a repeat of something like this. Um, so with respect to, uh, there, there's actually two parts uh, to that question uh, because the, I guess the first amendment is whether the, the customers will be billed at the 50% rate or the 33%. Rate. So the impact of billing to them at the 33% rate is 140,000, which will be funded out of a reserve account. Um, with regards to the interest, if we lower the interest rate, it works out to approximately $500 of savings per property uh, over the life of the loan. And bear in mind, there are a variety of roads that were paved here, so each uh, one will be a little different, so I'm just giving you a, an approximate. So just so you you said a, a a savings per property, so what would be the difference? Is it free to us to lend at a different rate? I mean, what what is the cost to the municipality? It's it, that that part is not built into our calculation because we haven't budgeted for it yet. Technically, right. we actually didn't incur costs because the province hadn't billed us. We didn't pay them. Gotcha. So, yeah. okay, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hensby. So just to clarify, so if we're going back and adjusting the percentage payment from 50% to one third, were there any other streets after this period of time that were also paid, paying at half the percent or 50%? So for you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, there are a few that are pending. That um, So the, the change for the 50% uh, occurred September 26, 2020. So that change would have been effective at anything billed after. Uh, September uh, 2020. So there's not been a billing on a J-class road 
since that time, um, but I understand there might be a few in, in the hopper that we do, uh, that are coming up, so it will be probably one more tranche of homes. So we'll be treating those the same as this one situation here? If that's Council's wish. Justice is served, thank you. <laughs> so speaketh the Sheriff, all right. <laughs> Count, uh, Councillor Clerk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think with, you know, the, the additional information, so we, we don't know what the impact is going to be in the municipality, and there are other roads that are or have been paved that we're still dealing with, and so, you know, I, I, th I think depending on how this, go how this goes, we need to make a choice now. We're either going 50% on all the roads, as the new policy is, on everything that was caught in between the last time and when the 50%. So it's kind of a very awkward thing to have kind of 33 and 50, but we're gonna vote on each one as they come now? And whether, how would that work? Like, oh, the last one we did, we, we gave them 50, and now we're gonna make you guys pay the, th uh, we're only gonna pay the 33. I mean, I think for consistency, so I'm looking to staff for some guidance here. For consistency, we either have to, you know, stay where we've been for the 33 on these ones, or we say 50 and now they're all 50 going forward up until when we change the policy. So how, how many more are we, how many more are coming that are in the hopper as you called it? Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Ed Surrett, Director of Project Planning and Asset Management uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. So back, uh, as Renee mentioned in 2020, uh, bylaw, S449 was passed, which made changes to S400 surrounding uh, the aid program. And at that time, uh, it was approved that any roads paved thereafter uh, would be 33% uh, to the residents, one third to HRM, and then 50% to the province. One sixth, yeah, so one sixth, two thirds. So, um, so anything paved from 2021 uh, moving forward would be at those uh, percentages. Okay. 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 So, Councillor Daigle again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just under the wire there. Um, so as I understand it, the, the property owners are along here, they were already advised that the cost would be 50%. And because the province didn't get the information to HRM finance, that's why the invoices have not been sent. So there's been a gift from the knowledge of 2015 till now of no invoice, right? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Uh, the customers have had the benefit of not, have, uh, not having had to pay for the, the paving since it was done, correct? And do we know exactly how many, if, if we do this and there are other roads, do we know exactly how many other roads and what the potential cost might be? Because we're right now, according to the report, the budget allows for that 140,000. Um, yeah, it says unbudgeted withdrawals, the alternative, if we do it for the 140,000, it, it still leaves money in the reserve. But do we know what the anticipated cost might be if this becomes precedent setting for the future roads that aren't finished? So, so that's through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. So these would, this list is currently the only list that, that we're, we're looking at that would potentially go from 50 to one third. Okay. Anything that's been paved since is, is under S449, which is one third okay. to the residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we are on the amendment right now. Ready to vote on the amendment. Mr. Clerk. Sorry, just one quick thing. I have added attachment one and attachment four to the amendment just to make sure that both can, are being adjusted to reflect the action. That is just the one change I wanted to confirm with the councillor. Okay, because it wasn't confusing enough. All right. All right. On the amendment. The amendment is carried. So we're back on the main motion as amended. There's no other discussion. 
We'll vote on the amended motion. That's carried. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Lyons, Mr. Surrett. Uh, okay. Notices of tabled matters. There are none. We've done the heritage hearings. Correspondence. Uh, pretty sure there was some. Mr. Clerk, can you confirm? Correspondence was received for items 12.1 and 15.22. All correspondence has been circulated to members of council. Thank you. Petitions. Uh, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a petition I've uh, submitted to the clerk uh, via email. It's from the Save Eisner's Cove group. Um, it's, there's 500. I did a manual count. Uh, they were, the columns weren't numbered, but I counted 504 names on it. Um, and they're seeking for council to direct Mayor Mike Savage and HRM's chief administrative officer not sign the development agreement with AG Lagro Holdings for the lands involved in case 23820. Uh, their main concern being uh, preservation of green space, uh, uh, dissatisfaction with the planning process, and that there is no public consultation as part of the project. Um, so the piece that I'm wondering about, um, rather than a formal referral to staff here, I'm wondering if um, we can get a response of some sort on this, rather short of an actual staff report, because uh, my suspicion is the, the signing of these documents where the province has taken over these special planning areas is more of a perfunctory type thing, not an actual exercise and discretion by us, and so I'm wondering if we could actually just have some sort of staff response to this petition. Mr. Dubé. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, the Councillor, yes. Uh, I think uh, Kelly Gadanti is prepared to circulate a memo to Council in due course on that. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Any other petitions, colleagues? If not, we'll go to information items brought forward. 14.1, Councillor Russell, first quarter 22 23 financial report, which came from Audit and Finance. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, I had asked this uh, report to come forward. Um, I saw a number of things in it, and I'm just wondering if, uh, Ian, if you could show that one page that uh, we had talked about. There were a few things that caught my attention. One of them is significant, and, I, and it might have an impact on, on how we uh, make some decisions over the rest of the fiscal year. And this is the page that talks about reserves. Uh, and it lists the different reserves that we have, and it shows that we have $475 million, it's page 20, um, in reserves. But of that $475 million, all of it has been committed except for $23 million. And of that $23 million, $10.5 million of it is in risk reserves, so we really can't touch that. Um, that's for... I don't know, a Hurricane Fiona or something. Um, some, uh, some catastrophic action uh, where we really need uh, to be able to uh, draw money out. So that leaves us with $12 million that were in the opportunity reserves as of June 30. Um, this equates to about 1% of the budget. And if we are and, and we did some of this uh, today, and there was uh, there was a discussion about, um, or I guess there will be the discussion about the roundabout, um, where additional funds are being considered for that, and it's an unbudgeted expense. Uh, so we only have $12 million as of June 30 that we would be able to draw down on without doing something else. And I just wanted to bring this to everybody's attention. Um, so hopefully, uh, we would be much more careful when we, much more careful, we will look at things with a much more critical eye um, when we are looking at unbudgeted uh, expenses because it's going to come out of this $12.5 million. Um, now, this was as of June 30, and I'm wondering, uh, Jerry, if um, you can let us know how much of that $12.5 million is left. How much have we not spent yet? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jerry Blackwood, CFO. Um, 
It, it's it's about the same uh, on that twelve twelve million dollars in terms of uh, what is on committed. Um, to the councillor's point, uh, typically reserves would uh, be a funding source for on budgeted amounts. But uh, as we're seeing with some of our capital overruns, we're looking to other capital projects, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do have a fairly substantial reserve amount. We have very strong liquidity, but, uh, you know, the, the money is committed to capital projects. And a lot of that happened last year with respect to uh, funding strategy for the strategic initiatives in Halifax, EV buses, et cetera. So that, that's where that, that funding is. So if there's not a reserve option with, uh, with respect to uh, a non-budgeted uh, capital overrun, there's always an opportunity to draw from another capital project that may be underspent. I just wanted, wanted to clarify that. But overall, the, from June 30th, the, the projection on the reserves, probably about the same. I think we had a drawdown on, on maybe one of the parkland uh, accounts uh, for parkland acquisition, but right. uh, it's, it's pretty much the, the same amount. I will point out that, <clears throat> you know, of the 12 million, even though they're not what we typically call restricted funds, um, you know, some of it is in density bonusing. So that is uh, related to affordable housing program and some of it is, is uh, parkland reserve uh, as well. So, you know, really one-time options, uh, things, uh, one-time funding uh, opportunities pop up. The option reserve is, is usually the, uh, the go-to and that has about $6 million in it on committed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jerry. So this was just a heads up again that we don't have very much um, flexibility when it comes to uncommitted reserves. Even though it looks like we have 475 million in reserves, we can't spend uh, we can't spend that without releasing it from somewhere else. So that was simply what I wanted to uh, to bring forward uh, for council's attention. Thank you. Thank you. And for those that <clears throat> are looking forward to that discussion, that begins very soon for the budget uh, season. Councillor Purdy. Mayor, I just had a question um, for Jerry, actually. Is this unusual? Like, ha has the reserves ever gone down this low before? Is this, is this normal for a kind of mid to end season or where does this stand on the normal scale? Yeah, I mean, with with respect to our reserves in past years, we, we had a little more capacity in what we call the general contingency reserve. So that reserve balance would carry, you know, maybe 15 uh, million in it at, at, at times, okay? So um, I'll take you back to last year's budget, right? So uh, direction from council was to come forward with a funding plan yeah around Halifax and our strategic initiatives. Uh, part of the budget was new reserve business cases were approved and part of the funding strategy for the strategic initiatives and Halifax was we did have to uh, consolidate some reserves and we right. did move uh, uh, some, uh, some money from general contingency into the uh, strategic uh, capital reserve. Uh, so that drew down on that balance, right? And again, that's about uh, building up our reserves to pay down the, the principal and interest when we start to take debentures when those projects are completed. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Arthur. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor, and thank you for bringing this forward. I just don't, I mean, Paul bringing this forward was very good idea. We have the 12 and then we have the 6 and we have to be uh, careful with what we do about one of opportunities and options and the strategic etc. However, I don't want to give folks the idea out there that uh, we, in addition to having a very difficult budget season coming forward, which we do, but we are still the envy of many cities to have such low debt and to have $475 million in reserves, whether they are assigned or not. So. You know, there's a glass half full and there's a glass half empty going here as well. So I, I don't know, Jerry or, or Jacques, if you want to speak to that, but while we have challenges coming forward, boy, compared to some other cities due to some pretty good 
management by staff and council previously, we are uh, sitting in a fairly good situation compared to some, country, uh, some cities across this country. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And, and you know, to the councillor's point again, you know, we we do have strong liquidity. Um, as I mentioned before, our reserves are committed yes. to capital projects. So, you know, what you know, what I'll say to council is, uh, in terms of adding new capital projects that Absolutely. have a reserve funding component or right. a debt component. Uh, that capacity, you know, ha has uh, has been reduced. Uh, so, you know, last year's budget was a real focus. If you, if you recall, we approved a bundle bundle of strategic projects that we're going to move forward and do. do. That really uh, committed our reserve uh, position to those projects. And as you know, we do have high inflation, so we we are. Um, you know, experiencing some severe cost pressures on on some of our projects, as you you've seen brought forward. So, you know, we do have a good, a strong liquidity position. However, there's not a lot of room to add more without having to say, okay, we're going to cut a project or we're going to push a, a project out into out into the future. And I don't think that's such a bad thing. Because there's a lot of cities and a lot of provinces who say we can't do any of this unless we can't do it at all or we can't do it unless we go into debt. We're saying we're going to have to pick and choose how we reserve our, our, our reserves, how we use our reserves a little more, how much we, uh, we take on new. So I just don't want the message to get out there that this council and previous councils, administrations, whatnot, haven't been uh, diligent and that we don't have that strong liquidity, as you say. Jerry. So, you know, the, there is some money in the bank. We got all kinds of things we want to do to our house. And we're going to have to pick and choose what we do, but we have some money in the bank. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it, absolutely right. And one of the other things, just to point out too, was, you know, with respect to our reserves, we always had. Uh, some tr strategic land sales Absolutely. that would be go going into reserves. Absolutely. And, and you know, um, I think, uh, you know, St. Pat's High and, and Bloomfield School Absolutely. sales were the last two big ones that went in went into yeah. that, uh, uh, that reserve, as well as, uh, as was brought up at the Audit and Finance Committee meeting, uh, you know, over the years, we've typically been, you know, uh, coming in with a healthy surplus yes. and we're socking away. Yes. I think in 2021, we put 30 million into reserves. Yes. Uh, last year, we had a healthy surplus, but in order to mitigate, uh, you know, the, the tax increase, yeah. we only put in three out of uh, $27 million yeah. surplus. Well, we, we paid a bit of a dividend. Yeah. Okay, no, well listen, absolutely glad we had this discussion. Absolutely great to be cautious and going into this with our eyes open, but I just didn't want the public to get some idea that we sort of have any problem that we're broke or don't have some money in the bank, et cetera. We just have to get a little better about how and when we use it. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> And by the way, the province does issue a set of financial indicators for all municipalities. And at our next audit and finance committee meeting, I believe, Jerry, we're going to be going over ours, correct? Uh, yes, tomorrow we have a tomorrow? presentation on that. Okay. That's good. That's an important one. All right. But we're doing okay uh, compared to, as Councillor Ruth had said, to most others. All right, folks. Uh, that is information items brought forward. Um, we are just about to begin our meeting. Uh, Fifteen point one point one has passed on consent. That's the request for proposal for managed print service. Fifteen point two coming out of audit and finance has passed on consent, uh, and that was an unbudgeted withdrawal in the amount of a hundred thousand dollars. Park development. We will go to fifteen point two point. Two, uh, budget increase, uh, alternative procurement, Broad Street North Roundabout, Councillor Outhit. And what an absolutely terrible segue. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> for me after my previous comments. But anyway, you know, you, sometimes you got to speak from the heart and the mind, and sometimes one gets to the head of the other. But uh, but anyway, I, uh, I what I'd like to do, Mr. Mayor, is I want to defer this, and I've circ I've uh, circulated to the clerk and to my colleagues uh, my motion to defer. Uh, do you want this just deferred now, or do you want to read the motion in and then defer it? Which do you prefer? Read motion in and then defer. All right. So I move that. Uh, one, uh, sorry, I move that Halifax Regional Council one approve a budget transfer of two million two hundred five thousand dollars from capital account CT one nine zero zero three downtown Dartmouth infrastructure renewal to capital account CTU zero one zero zero six Bedford Bedford West Road oversizing. Two, increase the amount of the March 1st, 2002 award of alternative uh, procurement 22-1024 uh, for the design and construction of a roundabout at the intersection of Larry U Tech Boulevard and Broad Street North to West Bedford Holdings Limited for a maximum value of $3,250,000 to a maximum value of $5,943,572 net HST included as outlined in the financial implications section of the staff report, report uh, at the staff report dated September 16th, 2022. All right, so that's seconded by the deputy mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Arthur. Um, so I think we've had some some pretty good um, discussions about this in the past, and I, I really want to thank. HRM staff, Peter, Adam, Mike, and others for the incredible um, communication and support that they've had and given me on this project, but all, and, and, to, and to Pam as well, and of course, uh, Scott and uh, Travis and Kevin at Clayton Developments. We are pushing very hard to get this built and in place for safety reasons before the new school opens at the intersection of Broad North and, uh, and Larry Utec. Uh, the problem we're having here is that one of the proposed uh, solutions, if you will, to the absolute nightmare that this is going to cause to traffic in the area was that we closed this for three months. And I think the councillors for the area, the public and whatnot have made it quite clear to staff that this is not viable. Completely credit to them for trying to come up with something to save money and expedite the project, but it's just not viable for a road that has now over 14,000 cars per day. Uh, and even was at capacity during the pandemic. So what we're going to do is we're going to defer this and while staff can go off and uh, do a supplemental staff report and quantify what it would cost us to, uh, to uh, bring night work uh, to this project as part of the solution to not having to close the road for, for three months. So uh, that uh, deferral is on the screen. You want me to read that in now, Mr. Mayor? Or? Let's read it into the, I thought, didn't you already read it? I, I read the original motion, not the oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. The deferral, sorry. So I move that item 15.2.2 be deferred until the November 8th, 2022 Regional Council meeting, pending the receipt of a supplemental staff report providing the cost of moving this project to night work versus the proposed three month road closure. So moved. Second, Second Councillor, Deputy Mayor. And I don't think I need to say much of anything more. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. I'll be really quick on this. Um, I also would like to extend my gratitude to staff um, and uh, you know everyone that has uh, emailed, phoned um, residents from one, two, well, District 14, District 16, District 10, District 13. Uh, it has been an incredible uh, amount of people who have said no to this closure. And uh, certainly we do need a more thoughtful approach um, to be able to uh, put forward um, y you know, construction in really what is a very underbuilt area. We have a significant infrastructure uh, challenge in West Bedford, and, and, and it's obvious that growth is not paying for growth. Uh, we definitely need a solution to Hammonds Plains Road. Closing a major artery of Larry Utec is not an option, so I, I appreciate and support this deferral. Uh, I'm just hoping that staff can actually uh, provide a realistic response as to whether or not November 8th is possible, or are we looking at a November 22nd meeting? I'd, I'd just appreciate a, an overview of that, please. 
um, Mr. Mayor, so sort of usually the Deputy Mayor, so you, yeah, we'll do our best to try to hit the number the, the November eighth date, but that's it's uh, I see Peter's coming to the to the, to the table, but uh, there's there's a there's a high probability of um, not happening on the on the eighth, uh, and if it not, we'll go to the twenty second. Thank you. And so with that delay then, um, if, if it doesn't come until the 22nd, I'm just wondering whether or not uh, this provides a significant delay or challenge uh, to that first phase uh, of the work, which was supposed to be starting uh, in early, well, in October, actually. Do, do we know? Oh, hey, Peter. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is uh, Peter Duncan. Uh, I'm the Director of Engineering and uh, Building Standards. Um, yeah, whether we meet the 8th or the 22nd, I don't think we'll have a large bearing. Um, as of right now, given the time of the year, the bulk of the work will likely happen in the, in the spring, in the spring anyways. So I think we're fairly, we're uh, fairly safe there. Okay, so we can we move forward with the rock breaking and that kind of uh, large work this fall, uh, knowing that we were actually going to do the the more kind of round um, road building in the spring that would lead to the closure. So there's two phases of this work. Yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, there will likely now only be one phase given given the uh, timing. We had reflected in in the staff staff report that was written a few few uh, months back now that there would be two phases. Okay. Um, as of this morning. Uh, given the time of the year, um, there will only likely be one phase um, that'll start and finish early uh, spring. And but we'll we'll speak we'll speak to that in the uh, sup, sup, supplemental staff uh, re report when we come back. Okay, thank okay. you, Peter. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I just wanted to ask about um, the project that this money is coming out of rather than s this specific project, because uh, we're uh, funding Bedford by borrowing from Dartmouth, and I hope it's borrowing, not robbing <laughs> from Dartmouth for it. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, that the report is pretty light on that, you know, uh, especially if we're deferring this um, for more information, if there's an aspect to that that um, should be further expanded or whether we have a plan to tackle that bit as well? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I mean, as always, it's subject to, uh, you know, ratification by uh, council, but um, my plan is to, like, we, we have a fairly significant amount of money booked for the downtown Dartmouth infrastructure for this year that's not going to be uh, spent. Uh, so the intent would be to take that, uh, you know, re, re uh, all, you know, re allocate it to the Broad Street North. We also know that there are projects in year two that will not get spent. So my plan would be to reallocate that money to the downtown Dartmouth job. Again, it'll, it'll, it will be reflected in the four-year budget that comes comes back. Why do I get the feeling that I'm watching the magician move the pee around? <laughs> I'm kidding, Peter. Uh, no, uh, that, that's, that's fine to me as long as we have a plan to, uh, you know, to replenish that for when that project's needed. Um, there's, no point, there's no point borrowing money that we don't need when we have money in another project account that's not quite ready. So I'm okay with that as long as we have the provision and it's understood that uh, we need to replenish that amount to get moving on the other one. Thank you. And Bedford will pay an interest rate, right? <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Austin, that comes under the category of it's easy to be generous if it doesn't cost you nothing. And so uh, we'll get it back. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, happy to support a report for supplemental information. Uh, you know, I, I do take uh, Councillor Edhitt's point around, you know, the the inconvenience uh, and, and empathizing with that, uh, but also his acknowledgement that it's gonna be a tough budget season and you know pinching pennies is gonna be something we're gonna get really good at by March, April of 2023. And uh, I'll also remind him and council that when CN closed the CN bridge on Quinpool, uh, that was pre-pandemic obviously, and that had 55,000 vehicles a day on it, that's 3.9 times the traffic uh, of 14,000 on uh, Broad and Larry Utec, 
Um, so we didn't have Carmageddon then. Uh, I don't expect if we close the street for a few months, we'd have Carmageddon then. But again, I don't know what it's like living out in the suburb and exurbs uh, and having to travel in, uh, but we'll see. So I'm interested in the information that comes back in the additional cost because I'll, I'll reserve the right to support or not until I see that info. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dale Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm pleased to support the supplemental request as well. Having had the experience of the closure on the Waverly Road, I'm a little bit uh, concerned about the communications plan to the community that is affected by it and how that communications plan will learn from that to bring forward to this. Um, the report doesn't really speak to that so much, so I'm just wondering, and I, you know, we do have the motion to talk about how much notice is required when you've got a major project and a street closure, so um, I'm just wondering how we're going to, to factor that in as well, please, and thank you, Peter. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I don't know if I have the robust kind of answer that you're looking for at this point. Um, but all I can uh, commit to is that is to acknowledge the point and assure your view that it's going to require, if we were to shut the road down for a two or three month period, that it would, yeah, we would need a very robust, uh, you know, public communication plan. Thank you. The voice of experience, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Huh? So when we're voting on a motion to defer with a supplemental report coming back, are we ready for the question on that? Okay, that takes us to the end of that for now. We'll move to 15.3.1. This is coming out of grants advisory, tax relief for nonprofit organizations. Is this... Councillor Diego Gammon. You can sit back in your seats for a few minutes and get comfy. This is a long one. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council approve one, approve the addition of 13 properties to administrative order 2014-001-80M as detailed in the discussion section of the staff report dated August 11th, 2022 at an estimated combined cost of $207,273 from operating account M311-8006. Two, approve an increase in the level of tax relief for 12 housing properties at a combined cost of $33,093 as detailed in the discussion section of the staff report dated August 11th, 2022. Three, approve four one-time grants in support of four properties developed under the auspices of the Federal Rapid Housing Initiatives Program, phase one and phase two, as listed in the discussion section of the staff report dated August 11th, 2022, at an estimated combined cost of $16,692 from operating account M311-8006. Four, suspend the application of section 7C and 7D of administrative order 2014-001-ADM in physical year 2022-23 by amending the administrative order as set out in attachment two of the staff report dated August 11th, 2022. Five, approve records management corrections and amendments as listed in the discussion section of the staff report dated August 11th, 2022 and as set out in attachment two of the staff report dated August 11th, 2022. And six, adopt the amendments to administrative order 2014-001-ADM as set out in attachment two of the staff report dated August 11th, 2022, including adopting attachments A through E attached to attachment two to repeal and replace schedules 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30 of the administrative order. Second by Councillor Mason, Councillor Daigle Gammon, anything on it? Um, I believe that uh, PJ, is, PJ Temple is here to answer any questions. The report was pretty thorough and answered most of the questions I think that everybody had. Some of it is housekeeping and um, the combination um, of the schedules has been uh, actually positively received by most of the nonprofits that I've been speaking with, so. Thank you. Councillor Othit. 
Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the uh, report. I've had a quick discussion with both the uh, the chair of uh, the committee, uh, Councillor Diggle Gammon, and with uh, PJ Temple regarding uh, removing uh, from this motion on page 12 the Atlantic Tennis Center. Uh, so we could have some further discussion on that. We're in a situation that I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail at this time, uh, but we need to um, have some further discussion rather than just saying um, we're not going to give you any more money and we'll help you with a payment plan, which is the recommendation right now. So I would like to uh, send this one back to the committee uh, for some additional discussion and perhaps a chance to uh, chat with me and others uh, about this situation. And neither the chair or PJ had a problem with that if council is comfortable with it. So. Okay, so is that a motion? Do we need a second for that, Ian? Yeah, is there a second for that? Councillor Russell? I don't see any discussion. All those in favor of that um, motion? Go ahead, Ian. So just a confirmation on this. We can vote on these individually or we can bring them all together. I, I don't know which is the quickest for one, if there's any more that are brought forward. But we can I don't see any other discussion. Uh, I think this is the only one. Right. This is on Councillor Outhit's uh, motion. That's carried. We're back on the main motion. Now as amended. Any more discussion? Councillor Mason? Sorry, I was a little asleep at the switch there. So just to confirm with staff in the committee, you know, we're waiting on that staff report regarding uh, providing tax relief to new construction, uh, which would be the 5940 uh, South Street Ronald McDonald House, uh, which is under construction right now. And, uh, you know, the concern of that motion was to make sure that while they were under construction before it was completed, they'd be able to get tax relief. The question is whether or not by deferring this, I see it says, uh, recommended the application for tax relief received by Ronald McDonald House be deferred till 2023 tax relief program. So I just wanted it on the record here. My understanding is because we're mid-year in the in the assessment and they, you know, are now in uh, occupy it that they're not subject to tax for this current year and that in 2023, we're actually going back a year right now that in 2023 they'd apply and then it would apply to their first year of being under construction. Is that correct? Through you, Ms. Savage, PJ Temple Grants and Contributions Finance. Um, with respect to that one project, um, PBSC has confirmed that that construction won't be assessed as taxable until 2023. So hence the deferral, they don't have to reapply. The file will be carried forward. Perfect. But in 2023, just for clarification, if they're watching, um, there is a commercial assessment on those lands. So we, we have to be clear who's being assessed and for what part. So whether the uh, new facility is entirely residential, we'd be able to clarify. If any portion of it is commercial, we'll, we'll have to dig a little deeper. But for now, okay. the, the lease has been signed and a construction permit will also trigger a reassessment. Thank you. All right, that's great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Just like a clarification regarding the construction in progress, it's my understanding that the assessment rules don't get adjusted until December and we don't see it in January. So I always thought that any construction throughout the season depends on when the property valuation services were on site to, to do a, a calculation of how much has been built to date to add that. So I'm just kind of curious of when the assessment finally gets added to the role is when we get an idea what the value of the tax exemption request is going to be. So there's a, there's a delay of a, up to a year or more before we get the true value of a, a tax exemption request. So I'd like to know in regards to how we do this midterm uh, calculation exemption when, the, when we may not even have the assessment value determined yet. 
Uh, thank you very much through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Uh, so you're absolutely correct. PVSC is assessed based on state date, which is December 1st of any given year. So as of December 1st, they would visit the site, and that is the amount of the assessed value that would show up on our roll for the following year. So my understanding is that um, even though they are, you know, not fully assessed, there will be, they are still requesting uh, relief based on the amount that they are currently assessed at, even though that amount will go up next December when PVSC visit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, ready for the question on the motion as amended. That motion carries. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Councillor Daniel Gammon. Uh, item 1541, I believe, passed on consent, which is Financial Incentives Program for Schmidtville and Old South Suburb Heritage Conservation District. 15.4.2 is a request to include 1322 Roby Street in the Registry of Heritage Property. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council set a date for a heritage hearing to consider the inclusion of 1322 Roby Street, Halifax, on the Registry of Heritage Property for Halifax Regional Municipality as shown on Map 1 of the October 3rd, 2022 staff report as a municipal heritage property under the Heritage Property Act. Second. Second by Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Mason? Question. Nobody else? Ready for the question. That's carried, thank you. Um, colleagues, I'm gonna just see, does somebody wanna move the in-camera minutes from uh, September 29th? Moved by Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor Deputy. Um, all those in favor? Opposed, the minutes are carried. Perhaps I will go to notices of uh, motion. We have no added items, so I'll go to notices of motion before we go in camera on 17.2. Councillor Mason? Thank you, Mayor. Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move first reading for proposed bylaw U112, amending bylaw U100 respecting user charges, the purpose of which is to make amendments related to transit electronic fare options. Anybody else? No notices of motion. So we're just before we go in camera, we have a meeting next week, right? Next Tuesday, I believe. Um, so that will be our next <coughs> meeting of council. Um, does somebody want to move that we go in camera? Councillor Russell, seconded by Councillor Stoddard. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Mm -hmm. 